My name is Jane Guberman, and today is Monday, September 19th, 2016. I'm here with George and Bella Savran in New York City at the home of Barry Holtz, and we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. George and Bella, do I have your permission to record this interview? Yes. Okay. I just want to do experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your involvement in Chavarat Shalom, and, and also the impact that the Chavarat has had on your own life and beyond. I'd like to start by talking with each of you about your personal and family background and to flesh out a little bit about who you were at the time that uh, you got first got involved with this experimental Jewish community that was getting started in Boston. So George, let's begin with you. Can you, you were born in 1947 in Brooklyn. Can you tell us a little bit about your family when you were growing up? Yeah. It was, uh, as I wrote there, uh, we grew up in Borough Park but it was Borough Park before it turned religious. Um, and so it was very much a kind of middle-class immigrant community. In other words, my street was uh, Italian largely, uh, plenty of Jews, Italian, Greek, and lots of communities like that. Uh, Jewish involvement was, uh, we were members of a shul. My grandparents lived upstairs from us. They were uh, more observant, um, but uh, any kind of formal Jewish thing wasn't much of, uh, of, of great importance to watch. Mostly it's centered around ethnic issues and family issues and things like that. And uh, so I had the normal experience of that sort, going to Talmud Torah. Tell me a little bit about your parents before, you, yeah. before we launch into they are They're already second generation uh, Americans. Um, their parents had come from Europe at different times, except my mother's mother actually had been born. She, was, uh, she had been born in America. Um, but um, they uh, spoke Yiddish or Russian to each other. Um, and my parents knew to understand a little bit of that, but not very much. Um, and uh, on one side, my mother's side, they were more religious, my father's side, less religious. Um, what did your parents do for a my, my father managed a, uh, a factory. Um, my mother worked as a bookkeeper for a couple of years before uh, uh, um, she, I think she had before she had my sister, um, and then she didn't work after that. Later on in her life, she did bookkeeping for my father's company. Um, so the business world, um, the home was uh, again I think of it as sort of typical Jewish home in the fifties. Um, uh, we value books and learning, but we don't read a lot. Um, you know, we think Judaism is very important, but we don't practice a heck of a lot of Judaism. We keep kosher in the home, but we'll go out to eat in a Chinese restaurant. Um, that sort of uh, milieu. Yeah. Um, so, at what point did your family move to upstate New York? We moved to upstate New York. My father's... Uh, um, my parents both wanted to get out from the circle of um, uh, my, uh, her, my, mother, my grandmother's uh, family, in a sense, and because it became a kind of magnet and all of her, she had seven brothers and sisters, all of them would come every Sunday. And on one hand, there was this nice family feeling, on the other hand, they felt invaded. Um, and they were not happy, for a variety of other reasons, they were not happy with living in New York, and so we moved upstate. My father's company decided to move upstate, and he got an advance in his job. What kind of a company was it? They made plastic sunglasses. Um, and uh, um, so we moved to this small town called Gloversville, which was about 200 miles north of New York City. Um, it uh, had a small but active Jewish community. Uh, and for me, it was very important um, because uh, both it being a conservative shul and also the Hebrew school situation was very different. Um, I began to take a much more significant interest in uh, Judaism and learning Hebrew and in uh, going to shul and leading services and things like that. Um, so that was very important for me. What do you think drove that change and in growing interest in Judaism? Um, partly the environment was more hospitable. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I mean, I, my grandparents would say, well, you're taking after your grandfather, but I don't think so, because I don't identify those particular things with my grandfather. Um, I give a lot of credit to the rabbi, the conservative rabbi who was there for one year when we moved upstate, uh, Rabbi Vanderwald. Um, he then moved away to another community, um, but somehow he was, for me, the first significant Jewish teacher 
I can't remember very much of what he taught me. I was in sixth grade. Um, but he was a significant figure for me. He was a significant figure. So I would give him more credit than perhaps uh, whatever. I don't know. And you mentioned also in your pre-interview questionnaire that you developed an interest in the Holocaust and also in Zionism. Well, then what happened was uh, at one summer, I went to Tel Yehuda, Young Judea camp. And that was a very important experience. That was between the, uh, after my 10th year, at my 10th grade in high school. Uh, and there was exposed for the first time to all sorts of uh, things about Judaism and Jewish life, even though Tel Yehuda was not a religious uh, community. Still, it was the first time that I would say I experienced Shabbat in a group setting that wasn't sitting around the family, sitting around the table with the family and eating gefilte fish. Um, but was uh, something of a spiritual experience. And so uh, the Holocaust came up around Tisha B'Av. That was the way that Tel Yehuda dealt with um, the, the whole business of, of, of fasting and things like that. Uh, and then after that, um, the time was quite, I think it was after Wiesel had already published Night. It was 1963. And there was a growing awareness of, uh, and a willingness to talk about the Holocaust um, in non-survivor circles, as and opposed to, I let's say, what you had your, yeah. Well, right? yeah, yeah. And so those, uh, those things sort of came together, and I was very active in, in whatever Jewish youth movements were around USY and Young Judea and, and, and other groups as well. Uh, and all of that uh, sort of fed into this very, uh, sort of, I can't actually say intense, um, yes, a sort of intense involvement in um, uh, a concern for Jewish, Jewish life. I had uh, interest already at that time about going to rabbinical school. I was very taken with um, Jewish culture in the sense of Israeli dancing. I didn't know anything very much about Jewish texts and learning. Um, but uh, those things were very important to me at that time. At some point you worked um at Camp Ramat. Right, that was, was that? that was at the end of high school. Um, I worked there for two summers in, in, in the kitchen. This? this was in uh, Wingdale in, um, oh, it's called Berkshires? Berkshires? Yeah, it's called the Berkshires. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I worked two summers in the kitchen staff. And those were very important experiences for me. Why, um, how did you end up working in the kitchen staff? I, uh, there was a program. I mean, I didn't know anybody who went to Ramah. Um, and, uh, I would think I was looking for work, and I, for, I forgot how I heard about it. Um, but uh, I knew it existed because I had been active in USY, um, but I didn't know anybody who had been to Ramah. Uh, and it was very important for me, even though I wasn't uh, on the educational staff or a counselor or a camper or any of those things, still it was the first opportunity that I had since Tel Yehuda uh, to uh, really participate in some larger Jewish framework that wasn't a USY convention or a Young Judea convention or something like that. What, what drew you in? What, what appealed to you in that, in that setting? Can you sort of put your finger on it or try to articulate One of the things about growing up in a small town in upstate New York was that there just weren't very many other Jewish kids. Uh, relatively speaking, Gloversville was pretty good. There were uh, 200 Jewish families, um, which was fairly sizable and an active community. On the other hand, um, there were very few different kinds of Jewish people. That's to say, either people who had gone to yeshiva or people who had gone to day school and people who were learned and people who came from more religious homes. Uh, uh, and part of the attraction, I think, of Ramah was meeting all sorts of people like that. Um, meeting sometimes rabbinical students, you know, who are at JTS, um, people who had gone through Ramah for many years, people who were counselors. And um, that was very attractive to me. You know? Have you ever experienced the kind of um, services or sort of the spiritual life that Ramah tried to foster? A little bit at Young Judea, a little bit at Tel Yehuda. That was the first time, you know, I experienced what I guess one comes to call Shabbat in white. <laughs> In, 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 in the Jewish camp experience. Can, you know, where everybody dresses up, everyone takes a shower, and everyone goes to services, and there's Kabbalat Shabbat. I don't think I had... And wears white. And white, <laughs> of course. I mean, that's essential. Um, but uh, I don't think I had a close relationship to the tefillot as a spiritual experience. The whole, you know, uh, avira, the whole uh, uh, setting was uh, um, was spiritual in that sense, in the sense that it was different from the rest of the week. 
um, but different from what I'll talk about later with regard to the Chavurah. Yeah. Um, so you went to college in the mm-hmm. mid-60s, 1965 to 65 to 69. At the University of Rochester. Yeah. So how did you decide uh, where to go to school and what were you interested in? I wanted to go to Brandeis. Um, partly because I had met some people from Brandeis and partly because uh, I was interested in Jewish studies and partly because I was thinking about rabbinical school and, uh, you know, in Brandeis. Brandeis already had this kind of cachet. Um, but I didn't have a scholarship. I was from New York State and New York State had these wonderful region scholarships. And the region scholarship uh, covered the, the, the largest part of my college tuition if I went in-state. So I looked at where to go to in state. I decided I didn't want to go to a city, so I didn't want to go to Columbia. Uh, I didn't want to go to uh, places like Albany and things like that. And then Rochester was there. Um, I got a good education. What did you study? I studied English literature primarily. Uh, I got a very good education. Uh, I met all sorts of interesting people. It did very little for me in terms of my Jewish life. In my, the end of my, or in the middle of my freshman year, I thought about transferring to JTS and transferring to the joint program, and I even went so far as to have an interview, but for various reasons decided not to do that. Um, so the, my college experience was very rich and um, very good in terms of uh, um, growth and intellectual growth and things like that, but in terms of contributing to my Jewish life and my Jewish experience, minimal, mm-hmm. minimal. Did you spend your junior year at Hebrew University? Yeah. That was um, very important for me. This was Um, 67, 67, 68. This was right right after after the war. war, Yeah, I arrived there a month after the war was over. Um, And it was a very exciting time. Uh, And uh, I was ripe for it. It was the right time for me. It was not the right time in terms of learning, knowing Hebrew. I didn't know very much Hebrew. And so many of the classes I took were either in English language or uh, or, or sort of what were called... uh, um, Anglit Kala, which meant... Ivrit Kala. Ivrit Kala. Ivrit Kala, but we said Anglit Kala. Oh, this is did? easy English, <laughs> because basically there was very little difference between the two. I see. Um, but it was very important for me, again, in terms of having contact with all sorts of other Jewish people my age, uh, in terms of being able to study text for the first time. This was the first, really, I would say, the first real encounter I had with Jewish texts. Um, it was nowhere near as intense as it was later, but I was ready for it. I had been studying English literature, and already I had uh, a kind of uh, deep feeling about English poetry and uh, ancient languages and things like that. And so I was ready for it. And it was a wonderful experience. You know, it was a wonderful experience. What do you remember about the Six Day War, and what impact was that having on, on you and others? who were there in the immediate aftermath. In the immediate aftermath, there was this general euphoria in the country at the time. Prior to that, I wasn't that aware. I knew what was going on, um, but mostly my concerns were very self-centered. Like, if there's a war, I won't get to go in my junior year abroad. That sort of thing. Um, My concern for the welfare of the Jewish people at that time, much less, I would say. Um, you know, it was appropriate to someone being 19 or 20 years old, uh, in a certain extent. Um, so how would you describe yeah. your, your sort of Jewish identity at that point and feelings about, and, and how did your feelings about Israel figure into that? Um, it was very important to me, but it was important as a resource. And once I was in Israel living for the year, in many ways I appreciated the country, in other ways I, it did not make me want to move back there. Um, I did not feel at home there. I felt like I'm a product of the American counterculture, and the counterculture is happening in America and not happening in Israel, okay? As witnessed by, let's say, 1967 when the Sgt. Pepper album came out from the Beatles. And some of us brought, brought it to Israel and played it for Israelis, and they said, well, you can't dance to it. And uh, that sort of defined it in a certain way, you know, yes. like, well... It's not about the experience, it's about what you can use it for. And so Israel was not uh, um, on the horizon for me as a place to live. On the other hand, as a resource for me in terms of learning Hebrew, in terms of study, uh, in terms of cultural things, uh, it was very important for me. Um, But until uh, I came into serious contact with Bella, um, I would say that I had not really thought that I would ever end up in Israel living. When did you two meet? 
we met in Camp Ramah, both of us working as counselors in the same, uh, uh, in the same age group in 1969. So this was later? This was later, right. Was I, had, later. I had finished college and Bella had just finished her junior year in Israel. We'll come back to that yeah. then. So were you still thinking about rabbinical school at this point? Absolutely. Absolutely. That was, that was my plan my senior year in college. And I um, went and applied to JTS, and I had every intention of going to JTS, and then JTS had the great wisdom of rejecting me. And uh, at the time I was floored. I said, how could they possibly reject me? I'm so wonderful. Um, but they had the foresight to see that this was not good. Also, it was 1969, and all sorts of guys were trying to get out on draft deferments. And uh, I think from their standpoint, I fell into that. And there were many ways in which I was um, antagonistic, uh, contrary, um, deliberately provocative uh, in ways that only looking back at the interview process and the application process, I could see like they could not possibly take me seriously as a candidate for what JTS was at the time. Can you elaborate at all? Um, one of the stories I've told many times is that on the uh, application question, one of the questions was, what is the greatest problem facing mankind? Then it was mankind and not humankind. What is, what is the greatest problem facing mankind and how can conservative Judaism help to solve it? Okay? Which is a fair question for a rabbinical school to ask. Basically, they want to hear a sermon. And my response was, do you want to hear a sermon? Don't you want to get to know me? How can this get to yeah, how can this possibly help you get to know me? They didn't like that at all. Okay? And so at, and in fact at my interview they said, well, tell I've elaborate on this, you know, and it was contrary. Um, that's, that was, you know, I think you know, uh, um, describes the situation to some extent. Well, in general, your college years coincided with a tremendous period of social ferment and uh, especially among American youth, and to what extent were you personally involved and or influenced by the, the general counterculture and all mm -hmm. the social movements that were... I was cer certainly influenced. It, um, I would say, enabled me, as it did a lot of people in my generation, to feel a kind of uh, combined alienation with um, certain aspects of American life, and yet a feeling like there was a larger group around me that um, shared my values and I shared their values and in terms of politics, in terms of uh, the openness of uh, relationships and, the op and things like that, that uh, there were certainly things to be gained here. Uh, I was not terribly active politically like most college kids. You know, I went to SDS demonstrations and uh, anti-war stuff and uh, various kinds of things like that. And at the University of Rochester, where I was, there was all sorts of protest against big business. At the time, Kodak and Xerox were the dominant forces, and naturally, they were the forces of capitalism, and they were bad in our eyes, and all, all of those uh, kinds of things. So uh, I, I would say I was um, a fellow traveler in many ways. Um, I enjoyed the benefits of all those things, and yet I was not out in the foreground. What wasn't there for me, and wasn't there until I got to the Chavura, was any connection between that world and Judaism. My friends in college were very lovely people, um, none of whom were involved in Jewish life. I had one friend, uh, um, slightly younger than me, who was involved in Jewish life. In fact, uh, she became a, a closer friend, and we uh, met later on in graduate school again at Brandeis. Um, but um, no, there was very little to combine my Jewish concerns with these kind of general countercultural feelings. Yeah. By the time you returned from Israel, uh, there was a tremendous amount of free-floating anxiety about the draft. How did that affect you? Very much so. I mean, that, you know, I, again, I was serious about rabbinical school, but I knew that rabbinical school would give me a, uh, a deferment. Um, and uh, certainly that was an important thing, and so I didn't even think of the possibility of uh, doing something else at the time. Um, in 1969, that was the name of the game. You know, we had to, we had to find some way. Either you were going to run away to Canada um, or do something else underground uh, or, you know, find some way to get out. So when you look back on that period, what do you consider to be the most formative um, experiences of that period in terms of your own sort of evolving identity? 
what I said primarily, I said on one hand this countercultural feeling and this sense of uh, uh, intellectual awakening in college, um, a, a kind of sense of openness about relationships and, 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 and society that was there, and on the other hand, um, a real thirst for something significant related to that in terms of Jewish life. Mm -hmm. So how would you sort of describe your sense of self Jewishly, your, your Jewish identity at that point as you were graduating college and sort of on the verge of getting involved with Havarat Shalom, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah, it wasn't suppressed. In other words, my friends knew I was observant to some extent. I would go back and forth with regard to things like kashrut. Uh, I would go back and forth with regard to things like going to services. Uh, I'd go back and forth with regard to a whole bunch of things like that. And so it, it wasn't a secret that I was certainly more Jewishly involved and Jewishly interested than any of my friends. Um, but uh, it wasn't as if I became a Jewish leader or sought to uh, express myself more in terms of what was available in college. What was available in college was uh, a kind of um, mediocre Hillel experience um, lots of social situations. There are many Jewish uh, students at Rochester, um, but very little beyond that. You described yourself as searching. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. So the searching was essentially focused on intellectual things at the time. I read a lot. Um, it was focused on learning Hebrew. Um, I had some uh, one or two courses in Hebrew texts, um, but uh, Nothing like what happened when I went to the Chavura. So yes, I would say searching in that sense, but I didn't quite know. I mean, the only model for Jewish life that I could think of seriously or that I had any kind of uh, thing to compare to was the rabbinate. In other words, I didn't know anything about Jewish academics. I didn't know anything about Jewish social, uh, 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 sort of like federation of the world or things like that. I didn't know very much about Jewish education. And so, um, like uh, not a few people, um, one went to rabbinical school and toured in order to become a knowledgeable Jew. Um, because there really weren't, there weren't Jewish studies programs around, um, except for something like Brandeis. Uh, and so I would say that uh, uh, what, did, what, what did you see the role of being rabbi as being at that point? For me at that point it was entirely standing up before the congregation, leading services, giving sermons and things like that. I had no understanding at the time of the pastoral role of a rabbi. And ultimately that was one of the things when I finally came to understand that and realized that that wasn't me, that moved me away from being, you know, from wanting to become a rabbi. So let's turn now to focus a little bit on how you became involved with Chavarot Shalom and the beginnings of your experience with him as a member. Then, Bella, we're going to talk to you, and then we'll sort of come together to talk about okay. the Chavarot experience. So when did you first become aware of this idea of creating a new Jewish so intentional So in my junior year in Israel, uh, I was in a class on the five Megillot together with David Roskies. And uh, David had a copy of the first issue of Response Magazine. And in that issue of Response Magazine, Art Green had his famous article on psychedelics and Kabbalah. What and, did you do in that article? Well, he talked about psychedelics and Kabbalah. And, you know, I said, oh, here is somebody trying to combine issues of the counterculture with the Jewish life. I said, this is very interesting. I still at that point thought only of going to JTS and thought only in terms of kind of uh, a rigid model of what, what, what a rabbi might be and what a Jewishly knowledgeable person might be. Um, but that was the first spark. What, what, was, what was Art's point in this article? Art's point was that the, uh, as, as I remember it, it's been a long time, was that the uh, religious experience, okay, the experience of the divine, um, uh, a sense of spirituality, um, was not the opposite of uh, uh, what he described as psychedelic experience, of a drug experience, but in fact, that experience could, the drug experience could enhance the sense of spirituality. And um, that was a real surprise. I wasn't a big drug taker. I smoked marijuana like most uh, people my age did at the time. Um, but just the no, very notion... No psychedelics. 
Yeah. No, I, you know, no, I didn't drop acid, you know, um, which, you know, which the article was talking about. But I, uh, um, but for the first time, you know, it struck me that there was some sort of meeting ground between these things. And um, also being in Israel and being a little bit more regular about going to services and things like that, um, questions about what a spiritual life might be started to form in some ways. I mean, I was always involved in some ways in Jewish prayer, and yet uh, it was not something that was close to my heart. Okay? Um, in other words, through music, Jewish prayer became important to me, I would say at that time. And then later on, the words took on meaning in, in a different way. Um, so I would say Art's article then was very, very important. But it was the very beginning. It did not convince me to say, hey, I want to continue and look into this business of Chavarat Shalom. That only happened when I got back to college. I applied to JTS. I had my bad rejection experience. Uh, and in the meantime, I had read something more that the Chavarat had begun. And so I wrote a letter um, saying uh, I'd like to come and visit, and I did. And uh, I found it to be uh, much more something of an expression of who I was. They were interested in me, and I was interested in them. And for the first time, I would say, um, I didn't know quite what I was getting into, um, because I really didn't have a sense of uh, the kind of depth of spirituality and the concern with the religious life that uh, really was central to a lot of things in the Chavarah. The university that I attended at the time was, the uh, University of Rochester was um, opposed to religious studies at the time. It was 1967, 68, and there was interest on the part of students. There was a big, there's a big seminary outside of Rochester called the Newton, the, um, I, I forgot the name of it, uh, but uh, there, there was a very significant person in 1968 named William Hamilton, who wrote a book about the death of God. And he was invited, together with a number of other people, to a, uh, a symposium, um, which was massively attended by students, uh, about the whole business of the study of religion. And so there were people who wanted the study of religion, but the university was not interested. There were various reasons given. Some say that the university had originally uh, had a religious past and wanted to separate itself from that. It's not quite clear. Some say it had to do with the uh, president of the university and his lack of interest in it. Later on, in the 70s, the University of Rochester in fact, did, in fact, start some Jewish studies and some religious studies. So um, going to the Chavarah and suddenly seeing that, let's say, what I had been reading about in a book by Gershon Sholem was something that could be taken seriously by somebody who wasn't a Kabbalist, um, that uh, the notion of prayer could be something other than performance. Okay, or something other than an entirely personal, you know, private experience. Um, this was new to me. This was new to me. And I didn't feel that, I didn't know that so much about when I visited the Chavarah. So the, visiting the Chavarah was part of the process of admissions? It was the process of admission. So I was you, in fact, I'd like yes. you to really describe that okay. process. I was the first person. So do, the, and you yeah. were coming into the second cohort. Right, 1969. Said. Right, so the, this was in the first year of the Chavarah's existence right. that you went to visit. Right, they didn't quite know what to do with me. I mean, they all were interested, and I didn't know what to do with them. There wasn't a formal process. They said, well, you should meet with Michael Brooks, and you should talk to Art, and you should meet with Barry Holtz, and you should meet with this person. And so I stayed for three or four days and had conversations with all these people. Was it over a Shabbat or during the week? Well, it was during the week. It was during the week. During that year, um, Shabbat services were much more limited than they became uh, uh, later on. But during that year, there were Shabbat services, but not on a regular basis. Um, not, uh, yeah, well, let, let me only talk about my own experience. Uh, and um, so when I got there, I met all these people. I had lovely conversations with them all. I sat in a couple of classes, which were wonderful. Uh, and, um, and what was your impression of the classes? The classes were, like I say, that, you know, um, there was a seminar in, I think, Zohar that Art was teaching, and uh, um, I had some knowledge of stuff from reading Gershom Scholl and reading some other things, but um, I didn't have knowledge of texts, you know? And here we were sitting around discussing a text. I say, oh, this is something. This is a new kind of experience. I also became aware of the fact 
of one of the things that became very important to me, and that was the communal aspect of it. Um, to some extent because people were living together, but to a larger extent because people were sharing their concern about Jewish life in a communal way. Uh, and that was amazing to me. And that was evident right from the beginning? Right yeah, from that first right from the first beginning. Few days. I mean, my friends who went to JTS also lived together, and yet um, when I went to visit them, as I did when I applied to JTS, um, and uh, stayed in the apartment of a number of friends, I didn't get the same kind of feeling. I mean, it was clear that the Chavarot was concerned with communal experience. How that was going to be defined was something that would, be, that would come up in the next couple of years. But yes, that was, uh, that, that was really a crucial thing. And so there was an informal interview process, you know, where they talked about me and I you know, thought about them. And then they wrote me a letter back in a couple of weeks saying, we like you, you know, and the feeling is pretty much unanimous, da 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 da, da and we'd like you to become part of the community if you're interested. Oh, it's wonderful. How important was the fact that this was building itself as an alternative seminary? seminary Very important. Because I was still considering, again, my model of um, to be an educated Jew was to be a rabbi. My career interest at the time was to be a rabbi. Uh, and the draft. All of those things, you know, were so were important. So yes, it was very important to me. Um, so what did you understand yourself to be committing to when you decided to become part of this second cohort there? I knew it wasn't living in a commune. Um, Not I knew everybody lived. No, no, only a couple of people did, because during the first year, um, it, yeah, well, during the second year, yes, uh, there were three or four people. There were never more than three or four people living together. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, living together in, in, the house, in, the, in the house. In the house. But, uh, um, let me think how to phrase this. What was I committing to? I knew, as I said, I knew I wasn't moving into a commune. I knew I wasn't moving into a religious situation where there would be requirements of me, as there would have been a JTS, saying you have to eat kosher, you have to keep Shabbat, and things like that. Um, and yet, it was also clear to me that I was moving towards a communal situation which was brand new to me. Um, that uh, the external things were going to be less important than the internal things. Um, and that was, in fact, you know, something that was new and scary to me. Um, I had friends, you know, and some close friends, but um, my living situation in, you know, when I was in college was somewhat communal, but it was not in any way intense, you know, in, in the same sort of way. So I would say that from the beginning, um, my sense of what I was committing myself to was I was committing myself to study, I was committing myself to being part of a community, and hopefully I was committing myself to becoming a rabbi as well. That was, I would say, my understanding in 1969. Okay, Bella, um, let's turn to you now and uh, start again by talking about your family and your background uh, to the point that you also became involved with Chavarat Shalom. So tell us about where and when you were born and the circumstances at the time. Um, my parents were Holocaust survivors uh, from Poland. And uh, after the war, they went to uh, Germany. So I was born in Germany in Bayreuth. Um, in, in 1949, uh, my father survived uh, with his brother, and my mother survived with her two sisters and uh, her mother. Survived the camps or otherwise? Survived uh, various things, labor camps, ghettos, hiding. Um, and uh, three of my grandparents were killed in the Shoah, and of course, most of their community. Um, my, uh, okay, my parents were very Zionist already in Poland. Uh, my father was in Hanor Hatzioni, and uh, my mother, I don't know if she was in a youth group, but she was in a school where she learned he spoken Hebrew, Israeli style spoken Hebrew. Uh, and um, so everyone from, who survived from her town speak, speaks or spoke Hebrew very well. Um, so this is in the 30s and early 40s? Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Uh, how, how old were your parents during the war? They were... Um, see, my, my father was born in 1918 and my mother in 1922. So they were like... Uh, 
20, early, 20s. And my father was early 20s and my mother was late, was in her teens. Um, and they, one of my aunts married somebody who was a doctor and he was older and he got a job in Bayreuth, Germany. They had all, this group that I just described had all met in Poland and they went together to Germany. Okay, their intention was... After the war? You're yeah, talking about? I'm talking about after the war. Um, they were all from, kind of from the same area in Galicia, in Poland. Um, and uh, they all intended to, go, to move to Israel after the war, um, once the state was formed. And um, then my uncle, my father's brother, decided to move to America, where, we, where they had an uncle. And uh, in the meantime, it was very hard in Israel, and so my parents decided to go to America with my father's brother, but always with the intention of eventually moving to Israel. And I was brought up very much with that idea. That and your grandmother? My grandmother moved to, moved to Israel moved to with uh, my, my two aunts, to Haifa. Uh, I unfortunately never met her because she died when I was like three years old. Um, so uh, then my parents uh, moved to the Bronx first and then to Manhattan. You were born where? You in Germany. Born, I was born. one and a half when uh, they moved to New York. You say your sisters were born here yeah. in the States? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't really remember. I don't remember Germany or the Bronx. <laughs> Uh, but I do remember Manhattan, uh, and I was there from the age of three in Manhattan, and uh, we lived uh, near City College in Manhattan. Uh, and I went to a very orthodox yeshiva uh, called uh, Yeshiva Samson Raphael Hirsch, Breuers, uh, until sixth grade, and then uh, to another yeshiva in New Jersey for three years. A Jewish, had moved yeah, they moved in, uh, when I was in sixth grade, they moved to New Jersey. Uh, my father changed business. My father was, uh, my father and my uncle uh, were in business. Kind of business. They began with groceries, with one grocery, and then they expanded to another one, and then another one, uh, and then, but they didn't like the fact that you had to work on Shabbat. Uh, and so in shul, even in their own business, they, they had to. Out. Yeah, they had to be in. It was too much uh, to leave to other people, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, which was true of many Jews at that time in the fifties. Mm -hmm. uh, so in shul, uh, my father in synagogue, my father heard from a friend about another business in New Jersey of building houses, and they didn't have to work on Shabbat. And so they moved to New Jersey. <laughs> and then we switched schools as well. Had the family been Orthodox all along? Yes. Yes. My, my father's family was more Orthodox than my mother's. Um, but in Poland, they were all Orthodox. Uh, and uh, after the war, my mother's family in Israel was not Orthodox. But um, my family in America remained Orthodox. My father. Uh, was from a Hasidic background of the Chartkover Hasidim. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but gradually he also became less Hasidic even in his uh, teenage years and became more uh, religious Zionist. And, uh, and so I grew up kind of with a religious Zion, in a religious Zionist home. Um, the schools that I went to at that time were not especially Zionist. The, the, the Jewish world changed. In the 50s, uh, the yeshivot uh, did not talk about Zionism or Israel very much. It was, it was good Jewish education, a good traditional Jewish education with good teachers. Separate for girls and Separate, all, all through, all through right? yes, yeah, until 10th grade. Uh, then I went to public high school. Uh, so it was separate uh, and very good teachers. Um, so I feel like I learned a lot as much as one can learn up till 10th grade. Um, and, uh, but they didn't talk about Israel in school and they didn't talk about the Shoah. So uh, that was quite difficult for me. 
because in my house, I would say the main subjects of our family were Israel and the Shoah. <laughs> uh, so, so the Shoah was talked about? Yeah, Shoah. yeah. In, in my house, the Shoah was talked about in a very natural way. Uh, Just back up and say, your mother died, though, when you were... My mother died when I was 16, yes. okay. in my last year of high school. Mm -hmm. um, so during your childhood, she was there, and this was a very yeah. natural... Yeah, yeah, we knew, you know, I actually think that they handled it. I, afterwards, I came to work with a lot of children of Holocaust survivors, so I heard many, many stories of how families dealt with the Shoah. And there were some where they talked about it incessantly and with too many gory details for children uh, or even teenagers to handle. And then there were some families where they didn't talk about it at all. And in my family, I would say they talked about it. They told us what happened with our grandparents. And, you know, they told us bits of what happened. Uh, and of course, it was always mentioned, but it was almost always mentioned in the context of appreciating and, and almost being in wonderment about their own uh, life, that their life continued. It was really about having appreciation and faith in God and uh, in the future. And the state of Israel was considered a miracle, a total miracle. Um, you know, they weren't especially political or anything, but it was more like oh, this horrible thing happened to us and now we have a country. And it was like an amazing uh, experience. So that's why I moved to Israel. Did your parents give up at some point on the idea of moving to Israel themselves? Yeah. When was that? Um, probably when they moved to New Jersey, I think. Uh, because in New Jersey, it was a better life. It was safer. It was safe. First of all, it was safe. Um, and they became more, uh, and my father wasn't working, so they, they became more part of the Jewish community. And it was a very strong Orthodox community in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And uh, I think they just became more Americanized, uh, although they continued to be in, in a social circle of uh, survivors. Um, but, uh, you know, they were there already more years, and they realized that to make the move didn't make sense. And also, my father was very, very, very close with his brother. And, and my mother with my aunt, you know, like really the two families did everything together, everything. Uh, so it, it be, after a certain while, it became clear that they weren't going to move, but that they yeah. still thought that moving to Israel was a great idea. So how did you feel about it? I always thought I would live in Israel. I always knew I would live in Israel, basically. Even when your parents decided to yeah. move Yeah, I didn't really think about the issues very much. It was kind of more like a almost abstract idea. I didn't think, well, if I live in Israel, my family's going to be in America, and that's far away. I, you know, as, as a child, I thought in much, I, I was very uh, ideological in my uh, way of thinking, in my personality, and in my concepts about the Jewish people, sort of the opposite of George. <laughs> um, I was always very political in my perspective, and, uh, you know, larger social change issues, and, uh, and I became a social worker, and you know, I really wanted to change the world. And did you feel American? No, I never felt completely American. Although I had a very good experience in America. Uh, I think after I after tenth grade, uh, I became somewhat more American. Why did you leave the yeshiva? Uh, there wasn't a yeshiva in New Jersey. Uh, the, uh, uh, right. I, I went for one year to New York, and it was very difficult traveling. It was really hard sitting in traffic, and I would come home exhausted. And so I decided uh, I was going to leave yeshiva with a lot of regret, actually, because I knew I would stop Jewish learning. Um, but, you know, I did it, and, uh, and I don't regret that I did it, because... It was good for me to meet non-Jews and to uh, expand the range of my experience. But I continued, of course, to be Shomer Shabbat and kosher. And so I was quite uh, 
an outsider in high school because I could never go to the football games and the whatever activities were going on in Shabbat. So I had friends, but I had a, a life uh, that was very separate from my friends no as well. No other Orthodox Jews no. in that environment? Not in, not in my high school, yeah. no. So um, then I went to uh, Douglas College, which was Rutgers University. So 1966? Yeah. Yeah, I went to college and... Uh, How did you decide that? Uh, my mother died. In 1965, my mother died. And I have, my sister is um, 12 years younger than me, and so she was four at the time. And uh, I needed to be close to home. And Douglas was a half hour away. I was commuting, and it, it was close to home. You were commuting from home? Yeah. The first year I commuted, and after that, my father remarried to a woman from his town, also a survivor. She, was, she and he were among the 20 people who survived from their town of 2,000 Jews. Uh, and she had widowed, and my father had widowed, so they got together, and I have two stepbrothers, and we became a very successfully blended family, I'm grateful to say. Very successfully blended. Uh, and um, then I moved to the dormitory after that. Uh, and uh, it was a, I had like a liberal, I enjoyed it. I had a liberal arts education. Uh, I studied sociology uh, and I learned a lot about racism and things like that. It was the years of Martin Luther King. And, uh, and then I studied art history. And then I went on the junior year abroad. Um, just before going on the junior year abroad, though, I did also go to Camp Ramah of the Berkshires. <laughs> but I didn't know, George wasn't there. George was already in Israel then. I think something like When that. I went, it was 1967, after the Six-Day War. And I heard Joe Reamer talk about the Six-Day War. <laughs> and very inspirational Zionist talk. He was there that same year. Is that right? In, in he had been there. He was there was the there year before, of the war, 66, 67. I was there 67, 68, 67, 68, and Bella was there 68, but He was 69. there during the war, there. I think. Yes. Anyway, so that was also for me uh, like a, a life changer, going to Camp Ramah. <laughs> I mean, for me, very much the Chavarot Shalom is like a counterculture expansion of Camp Ramah. How uh, Well, in the Orthodox world, um, I, would, I didn't have the concept feminism in my mind, but uh, I already was beginning to feel uh, the problems of being a, a girl uh, in Orthodox society. Um, in terms of what? Uh, in terms of the leadership, in the synagogue, you know, girls couldn't do anything so public. Participate in public worship. Yeah. In public positions. Yeah, girls couldn't do anything right. when women couldn't do anything. And I was just beginning to get a sense, although I had very good teachers in my girls' separate education, uh, when I would go to synagogue uh, or any place where there was like mixed things, men were always leading everything. And, uh, and then I went to, and also I wasn't really that 100% orthodox. My mother and her family were not that orthodox. So like we would turn lights on on Shabbat. And I mean, you know, we were orthodox, but with a flexibility. Uh, and I always had to hide that part of me in yeshiva. Uh, so when I went to Camp Ramah, all of a sudden there were, everybody was equal. Girls and boys were equal. And there was like halacha was not such a big deal. Uh, I mean. You know, it was Shabbat and Kashrut, but it wasn't so strict. And so for me, it was extremely liberating, both in terms of halacha and in terms of being a girl. What, what, can you talk a little bit more specifically about what kinds of, uh, how was it more liberal in terms of halacha at camp, for instance? Um, I think it was just the message, almost more than the practice. Uh, there wasn't a sin and punishment doctrine. I never agreed with the sin and punishment. That's pretty central, actually. It's a good question. I never agreed with the sin and punishment doctrine of like, v'hayayim shamoah. 
I always thought, my grandparents were killed. They were not bad people. Therefore, this, there's something wrong with the sin and punishment doctrine. It can't be true. You know, bad things happen to good people. And I thought, this I don't agree with. And so from a very young age, I think without more on the emotional level than uh, as a fully formed, uh, con con uh, than on a fully formed conceptual level, I rejected the, that principle, which is a very important principle in orthodoxy. And halakha in yeshiva was taught as something, if you don't do this, you're going to get punished by God. I, was, I never bought that. Uh, and so, you know, I think on an almost unconscious level, I was an outsider in that world much more than I realized later, you know, reading back into my own history, I came to understand. And, and also, we would do things on Shabbat. You know, we would go to the movies and, you know, do, we would do whatever we, not everything. We didn't ride, we didn't write or cut or cook, but we would do things. Uh, we were more relaxed about Shabbat. We would pick up the phone, we would turn on the lights. Um, so this was a place where... And all, all of a sudden in Ramah, everybody did that. Nobody in Ramah cared, and there was no sin and punishment doctrine. It was presented in a more joyous way, not as a something you have to do. And I think there's part of me that was always quite a rebellious against authority, uh, especially as I became older, as a teenager. And uh, so I liked the freedom of conservative Judaism. And it was like amazing for me. Because I, you know, when you're Orthodox, 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 all of a sudden you go to something that's conservative. It's like, wow, there's so much freedom. And yet they were Jewishly knowledgeable, not like my high school, where nobody cared about being Jewish or knew anything about being Jewish. You know, they still did text study and davening, you know, praying and, you know, they did the, the Tisha B'Av, like the show, as, as if it was Yom HaShoah. <laughs> uh, so that was very meaningful. That was, in Camp Ramah was the first time, for me also, even though I had a very strong Jewish education, it was the first time that anybody talked about the Shoah or commemorated or cried about the Shoah in a public setting, as opposed to just in my house. I mean, that's obviously changed a lot in the Jewish world, but in the 50s, it just wasn't. And 60s, you're talking about. And, and, 60s. and 60s, it just, no one ever talked about it, as if we were the only people, you know, only the survivors knew about the Shoah, and nobody else cared about it, which was very upsetting. So Camp Ramah was great. Um, and I also made very, a few very close friends there who had similar backgrounds, you know, like a lot of Jewish education, but more freedom. Uh, and then I went to Israel for my junior year, which was amazing. Talk about that. Um, what kind of impact did it have? Was this your first time in Israel? Uh, no, I had been actually just before my mother died on a tour, which was amazing for me to be in Israel, actually. Um, a teen tour? Yeah, Yeshiva University <laughs> <laughs> teen tour to Israel. And it was a very wonderful tour. Uh, and then I went to Hebrew University, and um, I just loved being in a Jewish country, and Hebrew, I loved Hebrew. I already spoke Hebrew because I had learned it in yeshiva. And, and you learned spoken Hebrew? Yeah. I had a wonderful teacher I mentioned in my uh, write-up, Elisheva Taitz. She was a fantastic teacher. She was at Sabarit. Uh, born in Israel, and she taught us to speak Israeli Hebrew in, in the seventh and eighth grade. And she really gave me a gift because by the time I came to Israel for my junior year, I was like on the top level of Ulpan briefly, and then I, I mean, I still wasn't <laughs> fantastic in Hebrew, uh, you know, uh, uh, that took a long time to get better, but uh, I was at a level where I could take courses in Hebrew. And it was really exciting for me. I took a lot of art history, because that was easy, because I was looking at slides and listening to lectures. Uh, but I also took a lot of Tanakh from a modern perspective, from a uh, like, you know, Bible criticism perspective. I had a course with Moshe Greenberg on Kaplan. I had a course on, with Malam, Malamat uh, on Yehoshua Shoftim. And, you know, I, and I learned with Nechama Leibovich. I, I just, it was like, 
<laughs> swallowing uh, the Jewish experience in a very positive way. In a very different way for you. It, yeah, it was, it was wonderful. I loved it. So, of course, I fell in love with a guy who was interested in Tanakh. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I also had, very, I had my Ramah friends in Israel, and so we would spend Shabbatot together, and we started having those communal Shabbatot that George speaks about, that we had learned in Camp Ramah. I didn't learn in Chavarot Shalom. We already learned it in Camp Ramah, and then, because um, we were counselors together in Camp Ramah, and I think, you know, we just did it with the kids, and then in Israel, we would do it together. We would do Shabbat so together. And also, I was, with, I was dating a rabbinical student at the time, so he also did Shabbat. Uh, you know, just communal meals where and everybody would bring and singing. Oh, I forgot to mention something very important about my home growing up, which I put please, in the questionnaire please, about please the singing. Do. Okay, my father was a fantastic singer, and he loved singing. And in fact, I have a video that I would love to show you of he of my father and my stepmother and all their friends getting together and singing. It's a beautiful video. Um, and they would start with, you know, all different. They would sing the Zionist songs and religious songs and everything. And that's how I grew up. Every Friday night we sang. And you said eventually you brought in um, uh, Camp songs we brought in camp songs, yeah. Even before, before Ramah, my sister and I went to Orthodox summer camps. Also, a lot of communal singing from, from age 10. And my father was happy to sing. He was happy to learn the songs from us, and we would learn from him. He would, a lot of it was learning from us. And then from Ramah, we had these shironim, these booklets of songs, and we would go through the whole book, and we would just sing for hours. But always the evening would end when my mother was alive with her singing these two mournful Zionist songs of the children moving to Israel from Poland before the war and the mothers begging them to come back to the diaspora, to Poland. And the children. in Hebrew? Yeah. And two songs in Hebrew. You want me to sing for, sure. uh, <laughs> for posterity? Yes, yes. So I'll sing a, a, a small amount. Sure. Okay, uh, one, but I really can't do it very well. I yeah. could send you the reference with the words. <laughs> yeah, uh, go, yeah one is called uh, Al Niyar uh, Lavan. Al Niyar Lavan, Lavan Kasheleg, Holech Mirtav Min Hagola. Kotevet em bedimat ayin, livna hagar birushalayim. And then, and da -da -da -da, she's telling him, please come home, please come home, it's dangerous there. And then he writes back, lo ashuv, lo ashuv, lo, lo ashuv, lo ashuv, lo. And then there's a similar one of a mother and a daughter where she's saying, na hagidi al dati. And then the girl writes back, No, Emily B. Mayam hu na 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 rak le eretz rak le eretz rak le eretz Yisrael. So that's how I grew up, and my mother crying because her sisters were there, and of course I want I wanted to live there. I didn't think about the fact that my family would be in America and how hard that would be for me later in life. What those parents were actually doing. I didn't right. identify with the parents. I only identified with the kids. Right. Right. Until now. Now, I mean, after when my parents got older, I, you know, I realized, oh, yeah, but thank God today we have Skype and it's easier. Yeah. Well. So that's my story. Oh, uh, and then in Camp Ramah, the second Camp Ramah, Palmer, I met George, and I met all these guys. So this was from what, Chavarat 60, Shalom. 68? 69. 69. Yeah, then I met George and several other of the people who were in, already in Chavarat Shalom, who were either just was beginning. Joe really like Joe. Yeah. Joe yeah. and Gail came, and uh, Larry Fine and uh, Richard Siegel, mm -hmm. and maybe some others Michael as Brooks. well. Michael Brooks was in camp as well. 
And, uh, and I really thought what they were doing was very interesting and creative and that they were taking the Camp Ramah experience to a new dimension of creativity and depth. And it reminded me much more of my home than Camp Ramah. It was because the singing was so deep. It was so spiritual. That was maybe more in the Chavara itself yeah. rather than yeah, Camp Ramah. I'm already yeah. switching to the next yeah. subject. So. Yeah. But that was that, that's kind of my So did story. you guys connect that summer? Yeah. Yeah. That summer. Yeah. And become a couple at that point? Yeah. 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 Okay. So Bella, let's just continue for a minute with how you became involved with Chavara Shalom. Only through George. So when did you first start coming? Um, I was in college. A yeah, at that point? yeah. When I graduated college, first I came to visit him. Uh, in that '69. Pretty regularly, he would come to visit. '70, yeah. and then when I graduated, I changed my plans. I was going to go right to Israel after college, uh, but I decided I wanted to be with him, and so I went to graduate school in Boston. At the EU. Yeah, and then we got married a year later. So what year were you married? 1971. So right when you were at the Chabra, involved with the Chabra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my, after one year of graduate school. Uh -huh. um, so were you, at the time that you first started coming, you weren't officially a member, is that right? Did no. you ever officially become a member? I don't think so. Okay. Um, so what are your earliest memories? Can you talk a little bit about what your earliest memories are? are of visiting the Chavarot that first year? Yeah, I would say it was mostly, I would say probably for me, three things. I wasn't so involved in study there because I was in my own study program. You were, you were studying social work. Yeah, and I was very, I was extremely involved in my social work education, uh, which was very challenging for me <laughs> at that age to be have all the responsibility of being a social worker that young. Um, so it was the davening, the, the, the services uh, were very powerful. What I was saying before, the singing. I love the, the Hasidic, the neo, well now afterwards I learned neo-Hasidic style of the singing, a lot of nigunim and all that. Uh, the social part was really great for me. I had never had so many male friends. And, um, and also couple friends. It was, uh, it was also the first time I really you know, I felt I, we blossomed as a couple and among a group of couples, uh, and I felt very fortunate about that. And actually, those have remained, as couple friends go, those have remained our primary friends for the rest of our life. Some of them, yeah. Powerful. Yeah, very powerful. And the Shabbat meals was part of that. You know, that was a structure. Okay, so we're going to come and see yeah. what we're going to yeah. talk about in the next. So let's actually turn to that. Um, and now I want to open this up so that both of you can participate. Um, I'd like to open up the conversation now for both of you to be participating. And we're going to delve into some of the key um, components of the Chavara, both, both in terms of the expressed ideals, but also in terms of the lived experiences for members of the community. So many people obviously point, as you were starting to say, to community as being sort of the heart of the Chavara endeavor. And so Chavarot Shalom was in its second year when you became a member, George. How, how would you describe the Chavarot's notion of community? It was developing. It was a work in progress. Um, for, uh, and I would say the work in progress had to do with certain kinds of circles which coalesced amongst themselves and then gradually the together. Mean? Yes. For instance, I was in a, a very good living situation with Richie Siegel and, and Joe Reamer. The three of us lived together, and um, we had a wonderful bond uh, as roommates, but it was also then sort of uh, expanded upon or enriched by being part of this larger community as well. In other words, it wasn't simply a good roommate experience. But it was um, we, as a kind of small grouping, shared this larger grouping. And there were a number of houses, you know, or centers, I would say, that uh, uh, um, uh, shared that kind of experience. Um, there was a center around the Chavara building itself, and art was part of that too, because art lived just down the street from there. 
Um, there was another group of people who lived in a house slightly further away, which David Rastis uh, dubbed Dorten, meaning over there. Okay. Uh, and then there were various kinds of married couples um, who uh, had uh, also sort of individual centers by themselves. So one was, let's say, Buzzy Fish, Buzzy and Mona, Buzzy Fishbane and Mona Fishbane. Um, and there were various other groups uh, uh, like that. And when we all came together, it was a tremendously enriching experience. Um, and uh, it was a kind of combination of um, Chaverut in the sense of uh, friendship developing and um, a larger experience that we were kind of looking at and I felt in a kind of um, aspect of discovery. And so tefillah, prayer, was part of the discovery. What did it mean to pray together? And it meant in part to be able to share some of that closeness that we felt with each other with other people as well. And What other people? First of all, with other people in the community, and then... Okay, you mean on Shabbos morning? On Shabbat, well, also first Friday night. In other words, there used to not be tefillot on Friday night during the first year. Uh, and um, part of the uh, contribution of the people in the second year was to have steady tefillot on Friday night. And so then it tended to be just the members of the community, or certain members of the community. Uh, and whereas Shabbat morning, it became known as a kind of neighborhood shul. And so there were these, again, various kinds of concentric circles. Uh, and the uh, experience of being at the center of that was amazingly powerful for me. Uh, and uh, it was added to by the sense that a number of us then became shlichei tzibur, a number of us led, 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 led the services, led the tefillot, or led group singing in various different kinds of ways. And um, one felt, once or I felt myself at certain points, absolutely at the dead center of the community. You know, other times not. But there were certain moments there where uh, it was uh, a brand new experience. And it was very different from the experience at Ramah or Tel Yehuda where somebody else was in charge. You know, and you could participate and sometimes maybe you'd be in the 10th row or the, tw or the, fifth, or the 8th row or something like that. But you weren't right up there up front. And you weren't leading things. And uh, um, this was a new experience for me, you know. And so the sense of intimacy and the sense that that kind of intimacy among friends could enhance the spiritual experience was brand new for me. And it was tremendously powerful. Can you describe the community at the point you, were, you first became involved? How many, I mean, how many members were there, for instance, just to start? The first year, there were something like uh, 15 or 20 members. The second year, it jumped to something like 38 members. It virtually the doubled in, yes, in 1969. It doubled in size. And it took in a different kind of a, a, a group of people. Uh, and um, that made a big change, too. And it forced a kind of tension in the group between those who had some Jewish knowledge and those who are headed for some kind of uh, career, probably, in the Jewish world, and those people who came in without any knowledge at all. And there was a split. And during that second year, we had a serious crisis, and a serious identity crisis about who are we and what do we want to be, and people were asked to write position papers. What do you want the community to be? I was kind of like scratching my head and saying, well, I want the community to be just what it is. It's just very nice. You know, I didn't feel the need to write a paper, but my friends did. Joey did, and Richie did, and Art did, and all sorts of other people. And we had these endless debates about what we should be. Okay, they, of course, didn't lead to anything clear. Some people left the community as a result of that. Some people felt that we should be more political. Um, there were people who were, you know, deeply involved in political things in, in opposition to the draft and things like that. Other people felt we should be a completely communal community. That is to say, all our energies and all our monies should be given to the communal structure, and that if we go out to teach Hebrew school, that's all we do. Whereas there were other people who were involved in doctoral programs. And at least half or more of their intellectual energy and their time was spent doing doctoral programs. Um, at that year, the first year that I was in, I was only involved in the Chavura. Okay? Um, but Again, I was sort of looking ahead, perhaps, to something else. Uh, so there was a real tension in the group about that. And um, it wasn't a tension that 
uh, damaged the group, I wouldn't say. Ultimately, it kind of made it stronger, but it made it clearer to some people that this was the place for them, and this was this and for other people that it was not the place for them. What was the relationship between the people who were there full time as you were in that first year and very committed to the seminary aspect of it, and those who were there part time because they were involved in other graduate work? Itself? Yeah, it really went person by person. Um, so, if I take an example like uh, Joe Reamer was very involved in his doctoral program, but he was very much present. He was very much present. Other people, uh, like Stephen Mitchell, was very involved in his translation work, uh, but uh, he was in a certain sense and preferred to be in a certain sense more peripheral to the community. Okay? So it really went person by person. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily determined by whether or not the person's involved in a doctoral program or not. Um, that was part of it. It had to do more, and I think this was brought out in these kind of position papers, with one's feeling about what the place of community was to be in one's life. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think it, uh, it may have had to do with the fact that many of us were still single at the time. There yeah, were girlfriends. Um, but uh, our involvement as individuals you know, remained at the center of things. And that changed gradually over time as many of us got married Okay, and uh, had to deal with the tension between um, having the home as the absolute center and having the Chavara as the center. Um, but in that second year, uh, it was clear to me that the Chavara was the center for me. That was, and I suspect for you, coming up and visiting, you felt that too, to some extent? Is that fair to say? That the Chavara was the center? The center, yeah. I guess, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as you started to mention earlier, in the first year, the Havra had met in a house in, on Franklin Street in right, Cambridge. Cambridge. By the time you joined, they had gotten a Danforth grant and had purchased a house in uh, Somerville. Right. What impact do you think the move had on the sense of community and the, the ability to create community? At the time, Somerville was not connected to the MTA, mm -hmm. and so Davis Square was far out alien country, and so rents were cheap, and it was easy to find places to live. It wasn't quite like being in Cambridge. In Cambridge it was much harder. There were people who lived close and people who lived further away. It also became clearer that the Chavara wanted to say, that uh, we wanted to say, people, we make a, rec a strong recommendation, this was something, a strong recommendation that people live within half a mile of the Chavara. So okay. within walking to easy Within walking, walking distance, yeah. Yeah. There were still people who drove and people on Shabbat and people who didn't drive on Shabbat, but um, that was becoming a norm. That was Why becoming was that a norm. Important? Um, because it could enhance the sense of community. It would enhance the sense that people would be part of things. Uh, and um, I think it was a lifestyle yeah. uh, issue as mm -hmm. well, not to ride on Shabbat. Do you think so? That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I don't. Do I, uh, it was a, it was in order. Lifestyle. Uh, well, to experience Shabbat more fully, more like in camp. <laughs> mm -hmm. Not to get in your car, because the minute you get in your car, you take yourself away. It's like leaving camp. It was more to recreate camp, it, which is not, a, I'm not saying that in a pejorative way, or kibbutz, or whatever. It was to recreate a neighborhood where you could walk, the old style, to recreate the Upper West Side. <laughs> if you would like to talk in American, in New York terms, you know, where people can walk to each other. It, it's a different kind of feeling than when you get on the subway and leave the Upper West Side to go downtown on Shabbat. You know, so it, it also presumably meant that people who didn't drive on Shabbat could easily could walk go to, to each, each other's, other's house. house. Yeah. Right, and everyone had Shabbat walk, meals walk, together walk, walk. to the synagogue, to the uh, Friday night dinner, to Shabbat lunch, mm -hmm. to Shalashudis. Shalashudis was a great thing there, too, because mm. it would talk about that? last. I, mean, I want to ask you about what some of the uh, ways in which the regular occasions in which the community gathered uh, yeah. outside of yeah. services. Here we learned a great deal from Zalman Schachter. Zalman was present in the first year of the Chavara because he was uh, doing, I don't know if he was, he was working as a, a rabbi in the Columbia Street Shul, I think, then, and various other things. Maybe he was doing a degree at Brandeis as well. But anyway, Zalman contributed enormously to the community. Uh, and one of the ways he contributed, um, apart from his presence, was with regard to singing. I mean, Zalman was a, an absolute treasure house of Nigunim. He was a Hasidic background. Because of, both because of his background and because of his special 
uh, a special voice. He had this kind of deep, resonant voice. And because he always had a marvelous nigun. These were the days when Shlomo Karlbach was around, but it wasn't like Karlbach nigunim were the center. You know, that's changed a lot. Oh, I he, mean, uh, let me just interrupt yeah. one other thing about Zalman. He did amazing translation into English that seemed un, like, spun, like he was looking at the text and just saying it in poetic English in a really cruel way. Uh, you know, so he made the texts uh, of the prayers accessible to, to us uh, in, in a really poetic way. He, he had a gift uh, with language. He would look at specific prayers and essentially chant them? Or he would, them. He yeah. would chant them first in Hebrew, then he would chant them in English with the same chant and poetically. I mean, I mean, it's a gift. I don't think that many people can do that. Um, I don't know if he originated that, but we felt he originated that, that, you know, it's a blessed is the Lord who does these things. You know, we just never said, wait, if it's, said, if it's in English, then it has to be spoken. You know, and you can sing in Hebrew. Can you sing in English And like he would that? also do it poetic. He would change it. He didn't stick it too yeah. literally. And Art Green also does it. Art learned from Zalman. Art, yeah. Art did yeah. it also. Yeah, I think I yeah. think our language. Anyway, the reason I brought up Zalman was with regard to Sudash Lishit, with regard to, to, to the third meal on Shabbat, that um, that became a very uh, central um, meeting point for the group, less around the issue of Torah, less around the issue of teaching or studying, but much more around singing. We would sit and sing for an hour or two. Can you describe it? Just how would it start? How would it? How would it? We Fiction. would be sitting around the table, we would have a little bit of food around like that, and somebody would start a nigun, and we would sing. Um, and it For was, a long time? It, it felt very spontaneous in the sense of the starting process, the involvement of it, um, and uh, it was, for me, a totally new experience. It wasn't like singing at camp. Singing at camp was like associated with the dining room. You know, it was nice, it was, uh, you know, or maybe associated with shul a little bit. And the song leader? Uh, yeah, and a song leader, you know, maybe an accordion player, maybe a piano Much player. more organic. But this mm -hmm. was something, you know, that kind of, you know, came from somewhere else. It was very spiritual also, deeply, I would say. Deeply it was, spiritual. It was really, you got into a kind of spiritual state during that Shalashuddha singing. And it was intimately spiritual. I think it's, mm -hmm. you know... I think it orig or, uh, its origin originally, not that we had the experience, but in the Hasidic tish, yeah. which is not a shul, it's a tish. And this was a tish. This was also a table. And singing together yeah. with the people that you feel close to. It was great. <laughs> yeah, it was a very important thing. And so the wealth of nigunim, partly we owe them to Zalman, partly we owe them to Shlomo Karlbach, and partly we owe them to... Other kinds of things. I mean, I became absolutely fascinated with, uh, with, with, with Hasidic songs. Then. And so I learned a lot from records. There were all these Vel Pasternak records of, uh, of Chabad Nigunim and stuff like that. Um, and so were you bringing new Nigunim for people? Like they were new to me. They were new to a lot of other people. Other people they weren't new. Chabad Nigunim from, you know, 200 years no, ago. No, but not sometimes. just Chabad. Boy, bo, uh, Bob well, of, Bob of Nigunim. Different Hasidic groups. He would listen to the records but, at home and then he would bring them to the Chavurah. Yeah, but, but it wasn't cool. as if I came from a Hasidic background and so I sort of learned this at my, uh, my Zaydis Tish or something like this, you know. Um, no, this was very much neo-Hasidic in this way. Um, uh, but it was um, a very, very important experience and a very different experience than anything uh, I'd ever had. And most people, I assume, had ever had. Had most people had this kind of experience? Of I don't think so. I don't Only think Zalman. So. Only Zalman. Only Zalman. Art maybe had it in different places. And some people had spent time going to Chabad or other places like that, I think. But not so much. Chabad wasn't anywhere near as developed, you know, developed yeah. as, it, as it became. Um, so yes, that was uh, a very, very important experience. Um, because it wasn't people from the yeshiva world. Yeah, yeah. There were people, a couple. They were more from the conservative movement. But also to add to that, um, Joe, for instance, Joe Reamer was from the yeshiva world, but he didn't have that experience from the yeshiva world. You know, and so the Chavra provided a kind of richness for them that he, that, that he didn't have from his home in Jackson Heights or from, you know, or, 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 um, or from his shul experience. I mean, he had more, 
in terms of the background, but um, no, Zalman gave us something there that was uh, truly remarkable. Um, yeah. One of my great regrets is that uh, one of the times when Zalman visited us when we were living in Indiana, he made a tape. And it was a lovely tape of all sorts of nigunim, and over the years, we lost, we it. lost <laughs> it. But I remember still some of the nigunim. <laughs> Want to share one? Um, one for Elul. This is one, and this is um, perhaps the first nigun that I ever remember learning from Zalman. It was at the first Chavara retreat, and it was from Psalm 27. And uh, it goes like this. Lecha malihibi Bakshu fahonai Et panecha to avakesh Lecha malihibi Bakshu fahonai Et panecha to avakesh Alata haster panecha mimeni alatat Miaf avadecha Alata haster panecha mimeni alatat Miaf avadecha we owe that to Zalman. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. What about other communal meals? There were there regular meals that were not collect, connected to uh, ritual occasions, like uh, yeah. before a meeting, those kinds of meals. Yeah, yeah, we had regular once a week communal meals um, in the Chavara. in the Chavara. We experimented with having them as kind of social experiences, and then we tried having silent meals sometimes. What were those? Well, you know, I mean, part of the model. What was the model for religious life? The model for religious life it either came from Chassidut. Or it came from the Christian world, you know, Retreats. and and some people, you know, who let's say had experience in visiting monasteries, you know, and there would be silent meals, would say, let's try it with the chavara. It didn't work too well for us. We were a very talky group. Um, we liked to schmooze with one another, um, you know, and we liked to joke around a lot with one another. And so, it wasn't quite the same kind of model that you might find in a Trappist monastery. Let's say where you know one of the the uh, elder friars would be reading a text and everyone else would be piously involved in their meal. So we tried it, it didn't work. Um, but the communal meal was a, an important event for us in Boston because we all came together and often it was before a meeting, a meeting later on. And the meeting might have uh, an aspect which was dealing with some sort of business and it might have some sort of uh, intellectual content afterwards as someone would come and speak. Um, but the uh, getting together on a day that wasn't Shabbat was a very important thing for us. You know, so it wasn't intellectual necessarily, it wasn't spiritual, and it wasn't around uh, devotion, mm -hmm. um, and yet it was about some sort of communal feeling. Was there a policy around uh, kashrut, for instance, at these meals? They tended to be vegetarian. Yeah. They were vegetarian entirely, I think. Vegetarianism was like the new kashrut for a lot of us. Okay? You know, because, well, kashrut is one thing, but, you know... The spirit of the times was vegetarian. No, but so. I think everybody had a kosher home. As far as I know, they all kept kosher. As far as I know, too. But, uh, but we didn't know everything but we didn't about know everybody. Everything. Nobody asked questions like that. Right. So and people a, brought things, and they brought them, you know, and nobody asked questions. So these them. were milk. I mean, they were dairy. Yeah, yeah. yeah dairy. all dairy. Yeah. 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 That's and it was very different from, say, uh, I'm sure you talked to people from the New York Chavara, where the communal meal was a whole different kind of experience. Yeah, done that, yes. It was an aesthetic experience, and it was a catered, that, that one person would prepare the meal for you know, a week in advance and stuff like that. With us, it was much more, uh, you know, hand to mouth. <laughs> yeah. So can you describe um, sort of the aesthetic of these meals and the sort of the, the feel of them, the atmosphere of them? You say something? Um, where first was, where did they take place? They took place in the Chavara building. And as we moved the tables together in one room, 
uh, and um, we would have whatever we would have. Uh, sometimes it would be uh, something very limited in terms of, uh, not quite rice and beans, but, uh, you know, a fairly limited meal. And other times people would prepare more elaborate vegetarian dishes. And um, we might sing a song, but generally not. Um, there would be, a, uh, there would be a, a bracha, as I remember, and there would be a bracha uh, And then at some point Barry Holtz would say, why don't we adjourn into the other room? <laughs> okay? And we would move into the next room in order to have our second part of the evening, something like that. Would you say there was a, a spiritual or, or even ideological component of the uh, sort of practice of kashrut within the, within the Havara? Mm, it's hard to say. Like I said, I think vegetarianism vegetarian. took, took over you know, for a while. You know, for people who grew up with, uh, let's say, keeping, kosh, uh, keeping kosher and uh, intended to keep kosher, but somehow it didn't express uh, ruach hazman. It didn't express the, the, the you know the, 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 the feeling of the times. Um, that the feeling of the times was well, you had to do something other, and you had to care about the world in a different way. Yeah, um, and like my cookbook at the time. Like what? I had a cookbook from those years called Victory Through Vegetables, <laughs> <laughs> and it was like the hippie vegetarian thing before the moosewood. Before moosewood and before the epicurean. What was it called? Yeah. The, vegetarian uh, before epicurean. all yeah. that, yeah. 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 Uh, I wanted to uh, talk for a minute about the Chavura as um, a Shabbat inviting community, because that's something that a number of people have mentioned. So meals that took place on sh for Friday night, typically, and, and Shabbat lunch outside of the Chavura house and in people's homes. Um, so can you talk a little bit about those, what your memories are of those, what their importance were in the community? Um, and also whether some people tended to be inviters and some people were more invitees, and how did that fall out? I'll be happy to start with that. Um, yeah, my memory of it, my memory isn't so great in general, but uh, my memory is a lot about the, the couples, the married couples uh, were more, they were a little older than the other people. Uh, that generation of Art and Kathy and Michael and Ruth Brooks, uh, mainly, Buzzy and, Mona. and Buzzy and Mona. They were like all a year or two older than us, so they were like older. <laughs> and they had like nice homes already, and, and they were the invite, invitors, and the younger generation was more the invitees. And then eventually we learned from them and we became invitors in wherever we live and as we became older. Um, for me, it was wonderful. It was very strong, and you know, I mean, I grew up in a family that did do Shabbat together, but only our nuclear family. We didn't invite people over from other families, or just invite friends or single people, or you know, it was. I I, I think it was. Uh, for me, it was completely new and uh, very warm. And, and welcoming, and it, and it broke the, the model of the nuclear family just sticks with itself. And, it, and for us, it very much became the, the way of the rest of our life. It set the model for the rest of our life, uh, in which we became invitors most of the time, mm -hmm. sometimes invitees to our friends who are themselves invitors. <laughs> and uh, it's a great lifestyle. Were these meals different from each other, the, the styles in which people tended to yeah. host? Can you talk about that a little People, bit? well, sometimes it was menu. Sometimes it was who was making kiddush. Sometimes it was uh, how much singing there would be. Sometimes would there be a teaching, a dvar Torah, or something like that. I mean, Art was the master of that, and uh, some of... What does of, that mean? How would he do that? Well, he would pull out a text and say, oh, da, 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 and Art's particular uh, inimical style, uh, you know, that he would start to teach it. And then a number of us sort of tried to copy that, you know, and, or develop our own styles with it. And um, At what point in the meal would he do that? Towards the end. I mean, after we'd finished eating, largely. In other words, not at the beginning. Um, not at the beginning. Uh, and often it would be a Hasidic text, you know, that he would pull out and he would have copies of sometimes. Uh, and uh, um, he taught us that, you know, the meal could be something more than just an occasion for eating and talking. But it could be an occasion for some kind of group experience, you know, beyond that in terms of studying. 
Sometimes there would be a Kabbalat Shabbat in somebody's home. Um, and uh, um, although as Kabbalat Shabbat became sort of uh, established, you know, for the group, um, we did that less and less. But in the first year when I was there, uh, you know, before Kabbalat Shabbat became kind of established that way, uh, as, as a group experience, sometimes it was in, it was in people's houses. Um, I would add one thing to this, and that is the second year that I was in the Chavara, I, uh, I lived in the house. Um, and uh, Bella was there a fair amount with me. And uh, there it was different in terms of meals. I mean, uh, we had the same sort of thing of having meals essentially amongst ourselves, I think. But on Shabbat lunch, we would invite people, different people who would come to Tfilod and things like that. And there it was a kind of broader experience, to some extent an extension of the uh, kind of wider experience of a Tfilot Shabbat morning where uh, people, various people would come from outside and sometimes people would stay for lunch. And so we knew all sorts of other people. And that was very nice. That was very nice, I would say. Um, and I would agree with Bella that um, that set very much those two kinds of things, set the model for um, how we saw Shabbat meals for the rest of our lives. That there was something to be done with the family and something to be done with something larger than the family. So in the context of this intense and intentional community, many people have commented on the constant need to engage in group processing. And we've sort of begun to touch on that a little bit as a, as a very salient memory of yeah. your experience. I, I wanted to ask you what memories you have of this and what role community meetings played. Um, and also, um, if there were particular kinds of issues or topics that tended to come up and that were needing the attention of the group as a group, what, what got discussed with these yeah. there would I would say two essential fora. One forum was um, the business meeting, where we talked about whatever practical things had to be done, who was going to be responsible for this. There was a uh, category called the coordinator. Okay. And the coordinator is the one who is ostensibly in charge for a month or two months, I can't remember, um, for sort of pulling everything together, for deciding about times and deciding about uh, um, who is responsible for the communal meal and various things like that. It wasn't a terribly onerous job, but I saw it personally as this is something for the people at the center of the community where I am peripheral. Um, I don't think I ever was the coordinator. I think I was always cowed by that situation. But the business meetings dealt with various kinds of things like that. That was one thing. The second thing was admissions meetings. And in admissions meetings, um, there serious issues came up, more so, I would say, the issues of who, 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 who do we want to be part of this community, who don't we want to be part of this community. Um, and there were always clear models of some people who we would like and clear models of people who we would not like. That inevitably brought up the question, well, what are we? Are we simply a fraternity? And the language of fraternity was very much the case during the first year or two that I was in the Chavara, where women were very secondary. Women were not formal members, only... There were some. There was the first year one woman who was a formal member and left. I forgot her name. Mm -hmm. In the second year, Mona Fishbane was a formal member, and Janet Wolf, Barry's first wife, was a, were formal members. Um, but most of the other women were secondary. Had, had Mona and Janet applied separately from no. their status as No, they sort of came into it. As, as couple, yeah, as a yeah. member of a couple. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but they were involved in study. They were involved in study and in tefillah in various ways. Um, Janet was the first woman to daven in the Chavara. Um, and that was a big change. So when Bella first came to the Chavara in the first year or two, uh, women did not daven. Right. I, and, wanna, can I want to defer yeah. that for a second because I want to okay. really get to the question of tefillah. In a okay. 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 Um, so back. So you were just saying. So this question of there were clear models. Yeah. Who we want, who we don't want, and it was difficult because sometimes we would like somebody, and sometimes we wouldn't like somebody, and sometimes we say, well, is it just based upon our personal feelings, or should there be some more kind of objective criteria? This person sounds very good on paper. Do we like this person? Do we want to be this, this person to be a chaver? And there were people who applied a number of times and were rejected. And that was painful. That was painful. Um, you know, I can think of one particular case where somebody, in fact, lived with some of the chaverim. 
um, but was not accepted as a, you know, a member of Chavarot Shalom because people had difficulty with that person. Um, that was very hard, and you know, um, it made us uncomfortable. Um, it didn't make us necessarily so uncomfortable that people left the community because of it. There were some people who left, um, and as I say, as I mentioned before, it was often around political issues and the issue of communal involvement, how, how, how much the community had a right to demand of its members um, with regard to time, with regard to finances, and other kinds of things like that. Um, so uh, those were some of the issues that came up around, uh, around that, you know, and, and it, it was um, difficult because we wanted to believe that we were an open community and we wanted to believe that everybody was welcome and we wanted to believe that this was the way of the counterculture and, you know, we discovered that that wasn't quite true, that we had pretty clear ideas about who we wanted to be friends with and who we didn't want to be friends with. We uh, also, yeah. How would, you, how would you describe who you were looking for? I was looking for people who were interested in the things that I was interested in. Um, I was not tremendously political, and so I wasn't looking towards political people. Um, some of the people who stayed in the community were, you know, were quite political, but I didn't necessarily become their close friends. I mean, the people who became my closest friends were people who were like myself. Um, and um, that's, I think, when you think you're creating the ideal community, that's very hard to admit. You know, what's the ideal community? The ideal community is the people who are like me. You wouldn't want to say that. You want to say the ideal community is a people that has, it's well-rounded and it's pluralistic and... No, that wasn't necessarily what we did then. Yeah. Um, this was uh, in the context of a community that had a very strong egalitarian democratic ideal. What, was there, uh, were there people who played real leadership roles within these meetings um, yeah, in general? Sure. And how did that sort of go over? It, Barry liked to say that um, art was more important than he gave himself credit for, but less important than we gave him credit for. At a certain point, Barry said that. I think there was a fair amount of that. That is very clear to everybody that art stood at the center of the community. Um, at the same time, art's leadership style was quiet and restrained. Art was not um, I mean, he certainly was a public figure in many ways, but he would not assert himself and say, I want this and therefore we're going to do that. That was never Art's way. Um, it was much more a conversation and discussion and persuasion and a willingness to be uh, persuaded this way or that. So Art was certainly central. Um, other people who were, Barry certainly was. I would say Barry Hall certainly was. Uh, and Joe Reamer was. You know, uh, um, They were very clear spokespeople for their, you know, for their particular ideas, and they represented a certain kind of model of um, a combination of the spiritual and the intellectual uh, and um, uh, an ability to teach, which was very important. I learned a lot about uh, being a teacher from being around those people and talking with those people, uh, and it was something that was brand new for me. I mean, I had taught a little bit before, taught Hebrew school and stuff, but never gave real serious thought to the business of education until uh, my contact with, uh, with those people and, you know, seeing or having them model, you know, what teaching could be all about uh, was a very powerful experience for me. As an intentional community, the Havara strived for this ideal of openness and ability to share. It was a sharing, sharing community in that sense. Um, I think it was Joe who wrote, Joe Reamer, who wrote at the end of the first year in an article in response, uh, a piece that described the Chavara as racked, quote, racked between conflict between individuality and communality. Did you find that tension to really be there in your own experience of, of the Chavara in the early years? I didn't. You didn't? I did, I did not. I did not. It came out, as I say, with regard to certain issues, with regard to meetings. Uh, it came out, um, I, I was perfectly willing to follow what the community decided as a whole. I did not have strongly formed positions 
about many of these issues. So when the community decided, for instance, that we should do a social action project, they say, okay, we'll do a social action project. I was never enthusiastic about it. I went and participated, and I did it with say, something called the Brookline Project, which was sort of like a drop-in center, which wasn't ultimately very successful. Um, but, you know, I did it, you know? When uh, we made a decision to go to um, a march on Washington in 1969, yeah, I might not have gone by myself, but together with the other Haverim, yeah, I went and did it. So I didn't feel that conflict so much uh, around those kinds of issues. I was pretty, pretty flexible and pretty open to doing those things. Um, it did, I, f I feel, it, it did come up later. Um, you know, once I, uh, but two things happened. First of all, a lot of the people who were central to the community left. This was around 1972 or 73, I don't remember the exact year. But a number of people moved to Philadelphia and moved to other places. And uh, I realized for the first time that for me the Chavara was, to some extent, the building and the people who were in the building at any given moment. And to another extent, it was very much Joey and Barry and Art and Alan Lehman and Michael Paley and that particular group of friends. Um, and that's when it came up for me more, a couple of years later. You know, and my own involvement became less and less. And that coincided with another thing, and that was pursuing a doctoral program. Uh, and uh, putting a great deal of my energy into that, and less energy into studying in the Chavara and things like that. So between those two, I would say eventually that kind of emerged as, uh, you know, my own uh, uh, plans for the future, you know, matured and developed. I think we should talk a little bit about the, about the Jewish catalog. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get so, to that. Okay. okay. I wanted to just ask you for a minute, though, because you you mentioned the sort of the the important friendships that you developed. This was a l largely a male community, um, at where male bonding was yeah. at the center of it, um, uh, for many people. So, how, how would you say this male context of the early years affected relationships within the community? And for you personally. It was assumed, it was assumed that um, men constituted the center of the community. And once Jewish feminism started to assert itself, and once women started davening, and once women started entering the community as individuals in and of themselves, I tend to think of Sharon Strassfeld as, in a sense, the most dominant and most forceful person very, with regard to those things. Very good shlichat tzibur. It was a very good shlichat, <laughs> but it's more than being a shlichat tzibur. It was, it was also her particular forceful personality. I mean, both she and Michael were, you know, uh, and are, uh, in, their own, in, in their own ways. But, um, uh, you know, being a guy, I mean, and you should talk about it, you know, how you experienced it as a woman. I mean, I mean being a guy, I felt like, hey, this is good. I like this, you know. It's 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 other guys like me, um, but you know. Bella, what was it like for you? Um, well, I'm not a shaliach tzibur, so it was never something that I wanted to participate in, in the leadership role. So for me, it was really about the friendships with the, uh, with the other people. Um, you you've been educated a lot in uh, intensely female environments. Yeah, so it was really fun to get to know men uh, who I really liked and appreciated. And I don't know. I somehow, although I I did say that I didn't like the fact that women weren't active being in leadership roles. I don't remember it bothering me in Chavarat Shalom mm. uh, because the the level of the davening was so high and I felt in other ways we were respected in terms of group discussions and stuff like that. I didn't feel... Did women participate in the group yeah, discussions? Yeah, definitely. You would come to these meetings? Yeah. yeah, I would come to those meetings. I didn't go to the study, but I would go to the meetings that were deciding on policy decisions, I think. So women, um, even these non-member girlfriends, we were wife, welcome. Were yeah, welcome I think so. More than welcome. I, I don't remember so much the admissions thing that you talk about, but um, I, I remember feeling part of the group and and enjoying the people, uh, the men and the women, and and many of the women became my, or some of the women became close friends. Um, I also remember very much the davening leading of Janet uh, because it was extremely gentle and spiritual and female 
And I remember the, the davening leading of Sharon because it was really strong and energetic and dynamic and uh, Michael's also, Michael uh, Strassfeld. Uh, that that was like the a next generation. I think they were like they came a year after couple you of or a couple of years, and you know it was like really refreshing to have that kind of um, powerful free woman leading. But I don't think that before that it was necessarily missing for me personally. I, I just appreciated the the quality of what was being done there. Um, I, don't know, I felt a little bit out of it, of course, because I couldn't be in the leadership uh, circle. But I was kind of busy with other things, so it didn't. Couldn't couldn't be because. Because I'm not a davening leader, and, and I'm not a teacher, and you know, it just wasn't my primary uh, interest at the time. I was busy becoming working on my own professional yeah. skills. Yeah. yeah. So let's. I want to sort of talk more specifically about tefillah and, and serve worship services um, in the context of Chavarat Shalom. Um, so you've been starting to talk about some of the people who made a really strong impression as, as daveners, leading, leading the davening. Um, uh, did, did, you, did you lead um, davening also, George? Yeah. What was that like for you? Was this in terms of other experiences you'd had, and um, it was less. It was much less performance and more group involvement. Um, it was uh, a feeling that first of all, there was the physical situation. Um, we were uh, against chairs, so to speak. We were all sitting on cushions on the floor. The reason we were sitting on cushions on the floor was because um, cushions had been collected. Uh, by Zalman and other people in 1968 when there's one day in Cambridge when everybody puts out their old furniture and so Zalman and some people went around and collected cushions. Yeah. Okay? It's largely so students can go. Uh, right, yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so sitting on the floor then in cushions became a holy thing. <laughs> okay? Was it holy? Did huh? you experience it as holy? We held it as special. I mean, you know, what could be more different than sitting in a pew in a synagogue? It was you like know? a counterculture thing. It was a countercultural thing. Like the way meditators sit on cushions. It's also not looking at people's backs of their heads, but potentially looking at people's faces. In part, part looking at circle, faces we were sitting, sitting around. Sitting in a circle and mixed men, men and women mixed. Women. The prayer leader was not necessarily sitting in one particular place. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. The Aron Kodesh, the Ark, was um, made from a wicker basket. Okay? And uh, which was, I think, I'm not sure what the pr original purpose of the wicker basket was, but then it had a macrame uh, a, um, parochet, a, a cover, which uh, had been embroidered or had been made macrame by Richie Siegel's mother. Okay? All of these things became various kinds of sacred objects, so to speak. Not quite objects of veneration, but. Because uh, they were different. You know, yeah. it was different than in a traditional synagogue. Yeah. It, the whole thing was to be different and to be young, to do it in a youthful, and to be intense, and to be intense, that the intensity of the davening was uh, considered to be a very important thing. That's right. Um, to that extent, we... And uh, leading people, leading, not performing, as you said. Yeah. Leading people What's with you. What does that mean? That means there was the assumption that whatever you sing could be joined in by everybody else. I wasn't going to sing an aria, mm -hmm. and I wasn't going to teach, uh, you know, use a very complicated nigan to daven. I mean, one of my experiences that I remember over and over again was of art leading services. And art, for all his talents, does not have the best voice in the world. And so when art would start a niggun, he would go, yum, bum, bum, yum, bum, bum. And I would look at Barry, and Barry would look at Richie, and we'd go, ah, we got it. Okay, and then we would pick it up, okay, and then gradually it would spread. So that was, that was a very important thing. Um, the communal aspect was expressed in a bunch of things. Um, we didn't do a straight beginning to end davening. There was always a choice, let's say, with regard to Pesuke de Zimra, with regard to the first part, the psalms that were said. Some of the psalms were said, but some of the psalms were not said. That, to some extent, followed or continued some things that were done at Camp Ramah. And basically, the, what's called the Matbeat Filah, the uh, basic form 
of the service starting uh, um, you know, with the uh, two uh, blessings before the Shema and one blessing afterwards and the, uh, the Shema Esrei would then follow. We tended not to daven Musaf. Who decided these things? These things partly happened by chance and partly happened by modeling. That say somebody was the shaliach tzibur and they did this and they said, oh that's good. And the so the shaliach tzibur made the decision about how it would go. Basically, yes. You didn't have a group decision. And then sometimes we had we Musaf and sometimes we didn't. Had a group decision. There were things that developed by habits. So, yeah. for instance, there wasn't a bima for reading the Torah, and instead there was kind of a low coffee table kind of thing. And then some people objected and they say. This isn't respectful of the Torah. You know, the Torah should be lifted up. But still, what dominated was the sense of this group participation. We were all on the same level as the Torah. Okay, the Torah, we were seated, the Torah was seated, you know, and, and uh, we all kind of shared the experience. Likewise, um, there tended, sometimes there were individual divrei Torah. Joel Rosenberg was a master of this. Um, but very often there were Torah discussions. This was also a brand new thing for us. Okay? I had never seen a Torah discussion in Shul. I know there were models for this in various different synagogues, both Orthodox, and, both conservative and reform, um, but I had never seen that. Uh, and that was another way in which the communal aspect was made. Uh, yet another way was... Well, can you, I mean, what happened in these Torah discussions? Sometimes they were real good discussions. Sometimes one person or another person dominated and the same sort of things became brought up over and over again. The good parts about them was that, were that um, they enabled people who were coming from the outside to participate in them. The bad part was that sometimes the same issue over and over again was brought up on Shabbat. It would be kind of tedious. Um, who decided the focus? The of... person who was in charge of tefillot. On a particular Shabbat. On a particular Shabbat, okay? Who was davening, and, and they would do that. And then it was pretty free form, as I recall. I don't remember that somebody made, made an absolute decision. If somebody wanted to give a Dvar Torah, if Joel Rosenberg, for instance, had prepared something, or Barry had prepared something, then they might do something, or Art. Or Art might decide, let's say, I want the tefillah, this Shabbat, to be focused around whatever. Let's say, let's say if it was Shabbat Shira or something like that. It wouldn't be about song, but it would be about, let's say, everything is focused around one particular theme. Okay? And he would try to do that by emphasizing certain things in the davening or by reading certain parts of Hasidic texts. So there was an interesting dynamic that took place. Part of the dynamic was, let's say, when Art would lead, would be that he would um, use these texts to kind of, uh, and do kind of sometimes these Zalmanesque translations like you described, where he would perhaps read some of it in Hebrew and then translate it in such a way that it would be accessible to people in order to bring out a particular idea um, right. Which would then be uh, uh, serve a, a kind of the, you know the central point of of, of of the tefillah. Sometimes it worked. Sometimes it didn't work. Likewise, the use of musical instruments. I play the guitar, and there were times where I used the guitar in davening, and um, I was never crazy about it. I liked it in some ways. But in other ways, I wanted the guitar to be yet another egalitarian voice and not to be part of the leader. Okay, and so I would do, try to do various kinds of things musically that tried to do that. It was, sometimes I felt successful, more often not successful. But that was another way in which I tried to break down the model of somebody standing up in front and performing and then people sort of participating or not participating in it. So all of those things, I would say, were uh, uh, really uh, uh, very important you know, to, the, to the whole business. We didn't have a rabbi. We didn't have a leader in the same sense. And if we did have a leader, like I say, the leader sat on a cushion like everybody else. Right. This was radical stuff for all of us coming out of, you know, conventional synagogues, whether Reform or whether even Orthodox synagogues. I mean, who did this stuff? You know, yeah, I know that there was a congregation, Soleil in Chicago, and there was this congregation here, and Larry Kushner was doing various kinds of things uh, with, his, with, with his congregation. But, you know, we felt we were cutting edge. You know, to some extent we were, to some extent we, it was our feeling about it, you know. Yeah. Um, but that was very important to us. In terms of the approach people were taking to interpretation of the Torah portion, um, how, to what extent would you say people focused on the parsha and sort of traditional interpretations, and to what, to what extent were they trying to bring in contemporary issues and concern? Very much um, contemporary issues. Very much about, contemporary issues. About making it psychological, bringing it. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. I, it's hard for me to recall somebody giving a Dvar Torah and talking about Rashi. 
I may, this is just maybe my faulty memory, I, I don't know. But my tendency is to think of things as, as a kind of, the uh, Torah portion was a springboard. And sometimes a springboard for discussion, sometimes a springboard for association. Okay? Um, I remember, I can't remember quite what the occasion was, but I do remember Kathy Green at one point reading this beautiful section from a book of Aldous Huxley about dying. Um, and I don't remember what, what, what the Parsha was, but it was a Parsha that had something to do with death and dying. And, uh, you know, she took it somewhere else. And that was lovely. And that was a certain kind of model. Did that work? Yes, that? I felt it worked. Likewise, I felt Joel Rosenberg's very creative and very imaginative drashot on things. The most famous one, um, which other people may have mentioned, no, was please. about Parshat Mishpatim. No, please. Okay, and there, Parshat Mishpatim comes uh, in the middle of the, of the book of Exodus, and it's uh, essentially a point where the, sto the story of the Torah ends. In other words, you had all the stories of the patriarchs in Genesis, and you have the story of the Exodus and, and, and the giving of the Torah at, Mount Tansor, uh, at Sinai, and then in chapter uh, 21 of Exodus, all of a sudden, it starts, Ve'elo Mishpatim, and these are the laws. You know, and Joel gave this drasha, and he says, this is a story about a slave, and a slave who wants to go free, but his family can't become free. And this is a story of a woman slave. And he took a number of the laws, and he said, and he gave a kind of very contemporary narrative approach to them. You know, and we were going, this is amazing. We never thought of something like that. Um, so if there was a tie to the text, it was to the t biblical text itself, and less to the Mepharshim, less to the commentators. There were exceptions to that, okay? I think Bert Jacobson gave an exception. Sometimes Art would, give an ex would, 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 would do exceptional things with regard to Hasidic texts. Um, but what mostly sticks they out They were trained mind, rabbis. Yeah, there were people who had gone through JTS <laughs> and, and had much more knowledge. Um, what about dealing with really contemporary issues, things that were happening with in the war, politics, uh, events mm. that were happening in less. American society? Less, less, less. less. It was not a particularly uh, political, I would say it was more psychological. Yeah. Psychological and literary. And spiritual. And yeah. spiritual, but... Uh, but less, less involved not in, so political. In, in, in the world. I yeah. think that the one in Washington was much more political. Art Waskow's Chavara was very political. It was a different tone. Yeah. yeah. It was coming from a different place. Very yeah. much so. Different, urban justice. Right. right. Uh, yeah. And I myself was also more involved in political things and less in the Chavara. You know, like on my Jewish uh, expression, I would say, was that I was working in a kind of lefty school news, uh, student news, I was in school, but a left student newspaper called Genesis 2 with Steve Cohen, Stephen P. Cohen. That was like my expression was, you know, uh, liberal Zionist. Right. Which another, another had nothing to do with the Chavara. Right, it was a Jewish counterculture. Right. Yes. It, yeah. a Jewish counterculture. it had nothing to do with religion or mm -hmm. spirituality. It was had to do more with politics. So you didn't try to bring that. It sounds like into the Chavara. No, it wasn't relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So it felt like separate yeah. realms to you. Yeah. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to focus on women's roles uh, specifically for a few minutes here. Um, so when each of you came involved, um, 1969 and 1970, um, what public roles, if any, did women have at that point in the service? In the, in the service, in the service, virtually none. There was one in 1969, Janet, 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 Holt, Janet, Janet Wolf, Janet Holtz, uh, at the time, uh, Davin Kabbalat Shabbat. That was the first time. That I remember. How much about in 1969? 1969. I remember that because Bella's father came to visit, um, and he came with us to Tfilot, and he was blown away. <laughs> he said, "That's the most spiritual davening I have ever heard." Seriously. He really said that. Yeah, yeah. It was a very moving. Yeah. Very what moving. Was him about it? Her voice, her style. Which um, was what? Can you describe it? Well. Uh, as much as I remember. No, gentle, spiritual, really from the heart. A yeah. And, yeah, almost Hasidic, I would say. You know, perhaps, not, perhaps, yeah. not a chazen, not a big chazen standing in front of other people. Yeah. 
interesting that your father responded. To yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, he came from a Hasidic background, so he had that inside him. You know, also the, in Hasidut, you have a more uh, internal meditative aspect, especially if you look at some of the slow nigunim. So I would say it connected for yeah. him, probably, yeah. I'm assuming. I never really yeah. asked him the question. I'm not such a good interviewer like you. I didn't ask him, what did you lo why did you love it? Um, but I, I, I'm assuming that it connected probably. to that part of uh, what he loved in Hasidut. Like he loved a certain Karl Bach song that was very slow and meditative that we would sing together from the heart. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Janet's so Davening. Other Touched than him. that, um, again, you know, in terms of the business of being the coordinator, Mona was teaching. Mona, Mona was teaching, of course. Mona was probably Kathy teaching. Kathy was. Kathy Green was certainly um, very present in courses, but I don't remember her taking an active well, role. Well, you just said she read. Uh, she read that in about the Torah. Death, uh, Yeah, she would do a Dvar Torah, but not in terms of leading Tefillot in the first year. No. No, but Divrei Torah she Yeah, would. but Divrei Torah she yeah. would do. Mona probably did too, but I don't I'm remember sure any specific did. ones. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. but, but in I terms imagine of leadership that other roles, people, pretty like, limited. I imagine people like Merle and Gail did too. I, I don't know. The year before, yeah, you I know, don't know. You know, people who were in that mode of giving what Divrei Torah. What about women wearing um, tallit or kippah? Do you have memories I think that? Sharon might have been the first no, no, to do it. No, women I, were, then, no, I don't Tali, remember. Tali Tod, I think, went, lots of women wore really? Tali Tod. Really? Okay. Yeah, lots of women were, not regular. Kippot, I don't remember. I don't remember women wearing Kippot at all. But Tali Tod, to be sure. I mean, you know, uh, it was easier to adopt a Talit. I don't remember anyone before Sharon doing it. Having a Talit? I don't know, but I'm my memory sure is... People, I'm pretty sure that people did. But why, I, again, why was it easier? Because it's because it's it's also a very feminine image of a shawl, okay, uh, and um, the talit itself doesn't necessarily have those kinds of masculine overtones that a kippah does, okay, um, or at least at the time. A regular talit. Sometimes a colored talit, or sometimes uh, yeah, I, I don't rem I don't really re I don't remember the details. Yeah. Um, how about counting women in a minion? A given. It oh, was of a course. Given. It was a given. From the beginning? Yes. Of course. 69, it was still already happening. Yeah, it was a given yeah. that women were. But I can't recall that we really cared about a minion. Right. It wasn't that halachic. Okay. It was like knowledgeable about halacha. I may be wrong, halacha, but I can't But recall. it wasn't tough about halacha. So even like a mourner's minion, people didn't care about a minion? We were young and we didn't have too many mourner's minions. Sure. But there were very few older people who came. And thank God, our parents, most of our parents, were alive and in good health. And so um, it's hard to remember anyone. I'm sure people did, but it's hard to remember Mourner's Kaddish at, at, at the time. No, but do you? no, I don't remember. But I, I'm, I imagine that if they were starting, if they were women and men, it didn't matter as long as there was a critical mass. It wasn't yeah. so like it has to be 10. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, in the early years, would you say there was any sensitivity around um, issues regarding gendered language of either liturgy or, or mm, classic know? texts? It's a little early for that. It's a little but, early yeah. for that. Before the Jewish feminist stuff in 1972, 1973, I can't think of I that. I don't know, I don't but, but I can imagine, yeah. even though I can't remember, it's not really a historical statement, knowing Zalman and knowing art and their deep uh, knowledge of the Hebrew language, I can imagine that they did play with it. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. yeah I just don't remember, I don't but remember. I, I think that they probably would have, yeah. Bella, even back then. In 1973, you joined a, 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 a feminist Jewish women's group, right? Yeah. Um, that became very important to you. So how, how did you come to join this group, and where, where was it? How, how did you find this group? Oh, I, I found it through um, my involvement with Genesis 2, okay. um, because my editor there was Stephen Cohen, Stephen P. Cohen, and uh, he told me about it. It was the Yom Kippur War, 1973, and uh, he said, oh, there's a, my wife is involved with a group of women, and they're working on a newsletter, a liberal Zionist uh, newsletter. Uh, and it was all in the context of the Yom Kippur War. So, so this, 
newsletter became Genesis 2? Or no, 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 no. Two? I was yeah. already in Genesis, Genesis two. 2. No, this was like a special newsletter. You know, I don't remember the details, but it was like focused on liberal Zionism. And, uh, <laughs> and I started to go and volunteer in that newsletter, and then I met uh, the women who were, several of them were working on that newsletter, and they invited me to join their women's group. They had already met each other at a big uh, Jewish feminist conference in New York. Mm -hmm. I think it took place in 1972, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So Ezra and Nashim yeah. had already come together. It was the time of that, yeah. Right, 1971, 72, or 71. And there was a big conference. Right, so they had met, exactly, in New York. exactly. I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. They had met each other at this conference, and they formed a group in Boston. And then I joined the group. So what was that experience like for you? And what was its uh, it was inter very interesting and uh, very uh, supportive and meaningful. Uh, we became a very close group. We started by uh, discussing um, Jewish issues, you know, like women and Judaism. Uh, and then we We're eventually, women you know, like what's the role of women in Judaism and mainly that, like the participation of, that was when I became more aware, I think, of, oh, women aren't included as much, and, um, and then um, it, it wound up being very personal, and, uh, and we just stayed in touch with, and, and it wound up being very influential on all of us in terms of uh, the way we um, kind of formatted our marital relationships and what we expected of our spouses, you know, the kind of subtle uh, and not so subtle changes that we wanted uh, to happen in the, in the relationships we were forming in contrast to what we had all grown up with. Yeah. We helped each other. And my role models were Elaine, <laughs> Steve and Elaine Cohen. Elaine. They were a little bit older than us. Yeah. They already were uh, having children, so the meetings were all in their house. Yeah. And they were like our role models of how to be a married couple and how to be parents in a different style. So they were a very important uh, couple for me. Did it have any impact on your, the way you were experiencing uh, life within the Chabura? I think it probably made me more aware of, uh, of some of the um, I don't call it hierarchical, but uh, you know some of the ways that women were feeling more left out. But I personally also just saw it as the women, like my I and most of my friends, didn't really want to do those particular roles. You know, like I, I never wanted to lead Tfilot. Eventually, George got a job uh, in a synagogue. Some, in some suburb of Boston, and he needed help. Uh, he needed my help to read the Torah and blow the chauffeur. So I, somebody, Danny Matt, taught me Torah reading, and I learned how to blow the chauffeur, and then I did it in Indiana. But in Indiana, it was a much less high-powered uh, synagogue. Yeah. So I could do it there, even if I made a couple of mistakes. <laughs> Uh, in, I couldn't do it in Chavarat Shalom. The, 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 what do you call it? The, the level, not the, it's an expression, the, the raf was Rough. too high. Yeah, the level, yeah. yeah. It was bar too was high, high. Yeah. the bar. The bar was too high for me yeah. to yeah. do what they were doing. Yeah. I would just add to what you said that uh, in this women's group, um, very few mem people in that women's group were members of Chavarat Shalom. That's Some were. Some you yourself and and uh, Naomi, Naomi Katz and That's Sharon all. Schumacher. Yeah, she, later yeah, on. A Sharon, few yeah, later. a few were, mm -hmm. but it didn't have a direct effect on the Chavara per se. Um, and I think it was already the time when we were, both of us, for different reasons, feeling uh, a greater distance from the Chavara itself. Um, not distancing itself. We still remain members and and still were active to some extent, but. Um, uh, for both of us, involvement was much less intense. Some of your key friends. Yes. They moved yes. People had yeah. Yeah. to yes. New York right. and Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, 
to what extent do you think men in the community were really thinking about these issues of women's roles, gendered language? Um, not very much, not very much. At a later point, maybe in 74, 75 or something like that, there was a men's group that formed. I was never part of it. Um, and perhaps they talked about those issues. That was when men's groups started to be formed, you know, uh, generally speaking. Again, I don't know exactly the years. But my sense was, in talking to friends, that no, it wasn't terribly um, important to us. I mean, it came up, let's say, in all of our relationships with our spouses in terms of issues of career and things like that. And uh, let's say for myself, that for the first time I thought, well, what does it mean for my wife to have a career? Okay, which I had never really thought about before. Um, and I guess, you know, just sort of had passively accepted, well, the model of my parents is that, you know, the guy works and the woman doesn't. And the sharing of household responsibilities. But, you know, those kinds of things develop. But uh, I, I, I don't think that among members of the Chavara, per se, we, we spend time talking about those issues. Well, no, I think that there. there was more, um, I would say, almost like unconscious stuff on the level of uh, the, the voice of authority. Mm -hmm. um, mm. you, know, you know, the way women uh, often don't have confidence in their authority, and men do. So I, I think at, at, when I was in my women's group, I think that uh, more uh, raised my awareness of what a pedestal I had all these guys on because they were such davening jocks. I mean, they were like so good at it, <laughs> davening and teaching. And I, I, I think that it did start to uh, make me question, you know, can I also speak with authority in that community, even though I don't do what they do, and, that, and what they do is the central subject of importance in that community? And, yeah, it, it, you know, I, I, I definitely think on a communal level, like personally, it was hard for me to find my voice there. I was like the official Zionist, I would say, yeah. uh, and a, at a certain point maybe feminist, but uh, more, well, more, more, more the Zionist. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, more the Zionist. Yeah. Okay, um, let's let's stop for a minute. Okay, I just wanna. In addition to the creation of a spiritual community, we've talked about the fact that an intrinsic part of the Chavara concept of community was the role of study and learning. Uh, and I wanted to ask if you uh, wanted to comment on the, the sort of pedagogic approach and the role of teaching and learning and teachers and learners in the context of the Chavara. Yeah, for me, I mean, the first year, um, there were three courses that I remember that were uh, very important to me, in, each in a different way. One was uh, a course that Art taught on Hasidut, and it was my first exposure to Hasidic texts, uh, and my first exposure to that particular style of teaching, um, the style of teaching whereby um, he would read from a text and then explain it. And the text, when he would first read from it, it was different from, let's say, looking at kind of coded text, like a Kabbalistic text. Um, because he would read from the text and you would sort of understand it, but you wouldn't understand where it was going exactly, and then he would kind of decipher it, and you would say, oh, um, this is really about a, a very deep issue that I didn't realize was being talked about in Jewish life. Um, whether it was about prayer or about consciousness or about speech or various kinds of things like that. Uh, and um, it was, I think, for all of us who participated in, in, in that class, uh, a very, a very important experience. Uh, and um, in many ways, it was the model experience for the Chavura in terms of the centrality of Hasidic texts. And this reflected a great deal upon the centrality of art um, and the agenda that art had for the community. And that agenda was really, I can't say dictated, by, uh, by those texts, but it was certainly formed and shaped by those texts and by those concerns. Um, a very important byproduct of that first or perhaps the second year was a book that Art did together with Barry Holtz called Your Word is Fire, um, which was translations of a number of Hasidic texts about prayer, and most of them about the intensity of prayer. Um, uh, a very, very beautiful book. It's gone through a couple of different printings and I think different publishers perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, if one reads that, 
you know, uh, those texts, you know, it, you can get a sense of um, how central the whole business or the idea of prayer was. I say the idea of prayer because we weren't very successful about implementing practical daily prayer. There was a daily prayer meditation group, um, but only three or four people went on a regular basis. Richie Siegel and Janet and uh, Art uh, and maybe one or two other people. I never got out of bed in time to go to it, you know, nor was I necessarily focused in that particular way. But um, it was a model. It was very much a model of what the community should be concerned with with regard to prayer. So that was one course. That was Art's course. A second course, which for me became more important um, because of the uh, career path that I took, was a course with Buzzy Fishbane in the Book of Psalms. That was, for me, completely eye-opening. Um, I had studied a little bit of biblical text in my junior year in Hebrew, and in my senior year I had a reading course with somebody, and we read some, some biblical texts, and they were very nice, um, and were very interesting, um, but in no way did I think of the Bible or those particular texts as deeply spiritual texts that could affect me. And Buzzy's teaching of those texts, you know, completely turned me around. Um, I later went to study with him and did a, and, and did a, you know, a, a, you know, a degree partially under his guidance. Uh, and certainly a great deal of the teaching that I do today um, uh, tries to pick up on some of those, uh, some of those ideas too. And it was the model of teaching was not necessarily different from anything else. I mean, sometimes it was straightforward, um, and sometimes, you know, he, Buzzy would just sort of knock us over with uh, the power of his uh, interpretation and the breadth of his knowledge, which was, you know, really exceptional. Um, but it was the ability to kind of unfold and reveal what was going on in these texts in a spiritual level um, that was, for me, absolutely revolutionary. You know, I just had never thought that um, the, some of these texts, which I had said over and over again in synagogue, you know, could have uh, uh, the kind of um, depth to them, you know, that uh, he revealed. And it was, there, can you give an example of a, a text? Let's say, let's say, take Psalm 19, Hashem Supreme Ale, you know, and um, the teaching that, you know, what goes on in that text where it talks about in the first section of a kind of mythical uh, interpretation or, 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 of the heavens speaking of the glory of God and presenting an almost mythical image of the sun going out, you know, Yavutz Kagibo Lahutorach, you know, uh, and then followed by this almost staid interpretation of Torah Adonai Tmima, you know, of sort of statement of what Torah is. And this is a kind of explanation of Torah and Edut and all these different terms for the law. And saying how, well, the sun goes out and it's powerful and it's mythological and we appreciate its power, but it's not steady. And what you have with Torah is something steady. And it looks like a kind of advancement. And then you go to the third stage. And the third stage says, well, but it's not enough. Gam of is harbahem. You know, but also your servant is both, the word nizhar means also enlightened and also informed and, and warned by them. You know, and then the psalmist talks about what it means to be a person who needs help. Uh, and for whom the business of the son or business of the Torah isn't enough. You know, and there's something more that's necessary. And there it talks about the relationship between the psalmist and God as something that's absolutely essential. And the revealing of that process going on in a text was amazing. You know, it was saying that um, there are all these different levels to the text, and um, it's moving towards a particular vision of what it wants the religious life to be. That was amazing to me. I'd never had anything else like that. Um, you know, in the state of me to this day. The third text was a seminar on New Testament which Joe Reamer and Everett Gendler led. My first exposure to a New Testament text. I, I mean, in college, you know, you read some things from, uh, from the Gospels or from, you know, the letters of Paul. Um, but here was something taken very seriously, reading a spiritual text from another tradition, which I had never done. Uh, and it was amazing. Um, the sense of exposure, the breadth, um, the fact that we had somebody from Harvard Divinity helping us out, I forgot who, um, but still it was the fact that here are these Jewish guys sitting around talking about a Christian text, and what's that about? 
And that also was part of the vision of things, that the spiritual life was not simply about Kabbalah or Hasidut or Tanakh. It was about an entire range of experiences. And that was also part of the culture, counterculture. You know, to be able to say that the range of spiritual experiences is not contained or limited by Jewish texts, however rich they may be. But there's a whole spiritual world out there. This, of course, we also owe to Zalman, you know, to a great extent. So yeah, so the teaching was for me absolutely just eye-opening, just, just uh, opened up a whole world. And then when I went on to do a graduate degree afterwards uh, at Brandeis, you know, I could appreciate the limitations of the academic study. You know, I, you know, uh, know how to do it, and I teach it sometimes. Um, but I am well aware of the fact that there's a lot more going on there. And I really owe that to my teachers from the Chavarro. Bella, you didn't take any classes there. No, but I'm very moved <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so it sounds from what you're saying that there was real respect for the authority and the expertise of people who those knew. who were teachers. Yeah, yeah people who knew more. Yeah. yeah. Despite the egalitarian non-hierarchical. Yeah. There was a tension between those two, but yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a striving you know, I would say, not among everybody equally, but there was a striving to become learned on some level. But there wasn't a, a, a social distance, necessarily. That's an you know, important which, point. Yeah. Like when you That's have professors point. in the university, you respect them, but there is a, uh, there's more of a social distance. Mm -hmm. How did the faculty, people who were there primarily as faculty, who had been invited into the community as faculty, participate in the life of the community outside of their role as in, in the classroom? Depended on the person. For Art, it was complete. Uh, for Buzzy, it was emotionally complete, although he was there less times. For some other people, they would come in and teach a course. Um, they appreciated the community. Everett, for instance. Everett, he, he didn't live in, you know, nearby us. And we would see him largely on retreats or when we'd go out to visit him or we'd come in and teach a course. Um, but he wasn't part of the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week life of the community in the same way. So it really depended on the person. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the response of people to those people also really depended on the person. There were people who held themselves more aloof. And then there were people who embraced you from the first moment, like Everett. Mm -hmm. you know, and for who that embrace was felt very deeply. Uh, and um, there were people from outside the community, too, who came in and taught. I um, had a very wonderful experience studying Talmud with a rabbi named Baruch Goldstein, who you taught for. In, uh, and he was a rabbi in Malden. Uh, and he came in to teach a class on Talmud. And it was a wonderful experience. He didn't include himself in anything else related to the Chavara, but because of a personal friendship with art, he came in and did this. You know, and we all developed, those of us in the class developed a close relationship with him. So it really went, there, there wasn't a kind of clear student-faculty thing. You've also mentioned several people who were members, i.e. students, in the, if, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, in the community, but who also taught, who were teachers, like Joe. Like Joe, like Joe. Um, so that, that happened as well. People yeah. were not clearly in one status or another. That's true. Or one status maybe the wrong word there, given... Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's true. There were, that, was, that was part of the egalitarian ideal. How much it actually worked out in practice, I'm not sure. And he had a yeshiva background. What? He had a yeshiva background. Joe did. Joe yeah, all yeah. the way through. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so he had some... Some, some yeah, fluency yeah. with texts, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I wanted to just touch on the issue of Zionism and the role of Zionism in the community. You, Bella, were saying that you were, in some sense, the, the Zionist in the community. Yeah. I don't know. Gail was also. <laughs> Gail also? <laughs> yeah, but I was more vocal about it. Yeah. Um, what was, how would you describe the, 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 the sort of attitude towards Zionism, the role of Zionism, and relationship to Israel in um, the It wasn't community? political. It, it was kind of... Uh, Chad like, Ha'am Zionism, sort of? No, I don't think they were so interested in Israel at the time. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think it was... So, 
it wasn't so important to them. They, I, 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 it's what mm -hmm. George said in the beginning of the interview. You know, it was more what they were going through at the time uh, mm -hmm. that was important. Mm -hmm. It was more about religion and spirituality and learning, and not about Jewish peoplehood. You know, they weren't active in the Soviet Jewry movement, or mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Disagree with you. Okay, you, maybe I maybe I, I read it wrong, but that was my my sense of it was that it was much more on learning religion and spirituality and community, and not so much on all of it, the Jewish people. There, I would I would disagree with you. Uh, I think with regard to Soviet Jewry, there were a number of people from Chavrat Shalom who went, who were sent by the Sochnud or whoever. That's true. Um, you know, and made specific trips, and for whom Jewish peoplehood was very important. That's true. David Roski's. You know, I take David, you know, both in terms of his trips no, to Russia. Also Art went to Russia. Art went, Gershon yeah. and Ruth went, a number of other people yeah. went. Hilla, but they weren't Hilla Levine, movement people. Who was the so central much. person. Um, yeah, they, but no, it, that was very important. Jewish peoplehood was very important, but not necessarily Jewish peoplehood, which led to yeah. political Zionism. Israel wasn't very important at that time. No, I, I, I think again, I would changed again, I would, uh, I would differ. I would say political Zionism was not at all important. Political life that was important to people in the Chavara was the political life that was going on in America. The counterculture fight against you know, the uh, stuff about racism, stuff about the war in Vietnam and things like that. That was the political aspect. But with regard to peoplehood and with regard to Jewish identity, yes, Jew Israel was important. Um, the notion of having a non-Orthodox religious life in Israel was not really an option. There simply wasn't much of an option at all, and so that wasn't taken. That was my particular position. It wasn't taken that seriously. But people spent time in Israel, different amounts of time, and different ways of spending time in Israel. But almost everybody that I can think of who was in the Chavara had spent significant time in Israel. Significant may have been a semester, it may have been a year, it may have been a summer. By the time they became involved with the Chavara. During the time they were involved with the Chavara. Right. Some before. Some people had been a junior abroad. Some people had been on the Hyatt program, which is a six-month program from Brandeis. No, that's true. Uh, Art had spent a year teaching uh, in a development town or something like that yeah. in the early and 60s. And Joe did a lot of and research. Joe, Joe certainly yeah. did. So, no, I would say that Israel was important, but not in the political sense, and not as a place that held a kind of potential for non-Orthodox religiosity. And that, for me especially, and for other people too, made it very difficult. That made it very difficult. Were there others besides you who were planning on making Aliyah? Joe and Gail were to some extent. Um, they were, and it didn't work out for them. Um, Gershon and Ruth Hundert, to some extent. Um, uh, Epi, uh, Seymour tried. Epstein, yeah. he tried, and he was in, he lived in Israel for at least mm -hmm. 10 years. Yeah. Um, so yes, there were people, but Bella was certainly the most vocal, I think, and the most uh, uh, clear about being, you know, about saying that I intend to go there no matter what. What about the group that left Chavrat Shalom to go to become among the founders of uh, Kibbutz Geza? Very yeah, there were a couple group. of people did that. A very curious group. From among them, only Michael Swirsky. I would say, was the most serious about, about Zionism. And he was the only one who stayed in Israel from that group. For the rest of them, uh, we felt, I felt when we visited there, I can't speak for you, but um, I think uh, the feeling was that they like it because it's a kind of hippie farm. Um, you know, and it's cool. I don't and, think we you know. know. I but I mean, but it was an extension of kind of like the Weiss's farm experience, but with real farming. Um, it fell apart ultimately, and not that many people stayed. I mean, the people who stayed, but this and the Mike was, I forgot the name of the fellow, Tversky, David Tversky stayed, and David David was a very important person there. Um, but he wasn't coming from the Boston group, he was coming from Washington. Uh, so there were some people for whom uh, political Zionism was important and staying in Israel was important. But for the people from Boston, uh, who went there apart from Mike Swirsky? Um, no, it didn't really. It didn't really carry. So I would really then emphasize that distinction between um, what people thought uh, Israel held as a future for their particular vision of the Jewish people, 
and the importance that they saw for Israel for the Jewish people as a whole. I think they saw that, but they didn't necessarily want to move there. But, you know, but things have changed. Obviously, some of the people uh, who then became great uh, leaders in the Jewish community and scholars and teachers now have projects that they're starting or involved with in Israel. Yeah. So, and they're trying to like develop uh, alternatives to uh, the establishment uh, in Israel. So things changed. You know, yeah. you're talking about a few years in the beginning of uh, yeah. the 70s, yeah. and yeah. you know, and they teach at Hartman, and they, you know, like so yeah. much has changed. Yeah. It, you're really talking about a very short uh, yes, period of time. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, I wanted to just circle back around also and give you an opportunity to talk about the retreats um, and within Chabrat Shalom, yeah. how those function, yeah. how frequently, what they no, were I like. I don't no. remember the okay. details. Um, we went on a retreat. Uh, we tried to go two or three times a year. A Jewish retreat was a brand new idea. This was something that we got from the Christian world, from the Catholic world largely. Um, the notion of Jewish retreat, Jews don't go on a retreat. Maybe they go to visit the Rebbe, okay? <laughs> that might have been a Jewish retreat back in Poland. But Jews go on retreat? In the Vakaze, there's no, you know, this unheard of. And um, here, uh, the experience that some people had had going on, you know, going to monasteries or going to Christian retreat houses, Packard Manse, um, was very important. And we tried to do this a number of times. Each year we would go on retreat definitely for Sukkot, and sometimes one or two times a year in addition. Uh, and what it meant for us were different kinds of things. First, it meant the community getting together for Shabbat just by itself. Uh, and there, there was a certain curious conflict. Because on one hand, we say, oh, now we can just dive in by ourselves and it'll be really great. Well, it wasn't so great. Um, that one of the things we discovered was that, in fact, we were very dependent upon all those outside people coming and appreciating us. Okay? And so people would sort of schlep into services late, you know, or they wouldn't get into davening so much, you know, or they would skip services. What's going on here? You know, on the other hand, the social aspect of those things was very important. Where would they take place? They would take place, we tried different places. Packard Mance we did once or twice. We had a what retreat. Was Packard Mance? Packard Mance was a, a Protestant retreat house in, uh, in Canton, uh, near Sharon. Uh, and uh, um, I think Everett had done some work there. Uh, and uh, so we knew about the place. So that was one place that was available. Another place, there was a, a Catholic retreat uh, center up in Methuen in northern Massachusetts that we went to sometimes, and then other times we went to Camp Ramah and Palmer, which wasn't a bad location, but wasn't great. Um, it had <coughs> bunk beds. It was in the old infirmary there, and, and uh, it, was, it was less than comfortable. Other places were less than comfortable because they had a cross on in every single room. You know, and so sometimes we'd go and take down the crosses when we were there. Um, but the experience of going on retreat by ourselves was a marvelous experience. I mean, even if it sort of brought out this sense of, well, you know, we're not as uh, independently spiritual as we'd like to think we are. Um, the sense of having communal meals, you know, a number of them together on Shabbat, the sense of being able to have this kind of intense singing experience, study experience, um, and um, sometimes a little bit of nature walk, but not too much. Um, being able, if we went to Camp Ramah, being able to use the, uh, uh, um, the lake as a kind of mikveh. I remember one Shavuot retreat where, in fact, you know, we did that. You know, it was freezing cold, but, uh, you know, um, in, you know, the, you know, the Shavuot morning, yes, some of us jumped in. Uh, um, and that was very powerful. And so there was a sense in which we could have a new kind of experience, a different kind of experience by going on retreat. Did, would you say it... Uh, work to intensify or otherwise have an impact on the, the sense of community? I think for the time of the retreat it did. I'm not sure what the lasting effect of those retreats were. Um, they were very good for the inclusion of people, someone like Everett, who we didn't see that much. But Everett would come for the, you know, Everett Mary would come for the retreat and, you know, their presence was, uh, you know, very important. Sometimes there were other guests who would come. Did but Zalman ever come? 
Uh, I can't recall. The, I wasn't there the first year when Zalman was there. Um, but other than that, no. Zalman would come for Shabbatot sometimes, and he would come for Rosh Hashanah, because he would do Rosh Hashanah services at the Columbia Street Shul. Um, and, uh, but I don't remember a retreat with Zalman. Uh, either. Did you ever participate in the retreats at Wes's farm? I never did, no. You never did? Neither of okay. us did. It started, I, I believe, in about 73. So Something it was at like the time that, yeah. that you were sort of becoming less involved. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's uh, turn now to uh, sort of trying to reflect on some of the meaning and impact of the Chavarat on yourselves personally and in the larger Jewish uh, sphere. So just to recap, George, uh, you started from in 1969, Bella, you in 1970, and you were basically very inten pretty intensely involved through 1973. Yeah. Um, uh, what kind of involvement uh, ongo of an ongoing nature did you have with, with the Hover Road um, in the years that followed, if any? Um, very little. In other words, I still had a connection with Chavarat Shalom in terms of going to Tefillot. Um, I might have taught a course. I don't remember. Um, I had friends who were still there. Uh, but um, my involvement in it, in the same sense of seeing that as kind of the centerpiece of, uh, of my life, or my religious life, was, was much less clear. Did you ever uh, go to any of the Havara Summer Institutes? Uh, only, only one in 19... Well, no, I went to two. Um, and before we moved... When we were in Bloomington, uh, we were in Indiana, I went to one in 1981. Mm -hmm. And then when we were in Israel, I came back and taught at another one, I think, in 1984. Um, and just those are the only two times I went. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, no, I didn't. We, again, once we were in uh, Indiana, uh, we were kind of distant from the whole experience. Uh, so would you say that the Chavara, or what you took from your experiences there, continues to shape your Jewish life? Uh, yeah, absolutely. How absolutely. Yeah. Talk about Do you that? want to talk both about that? Both of you, yeah. talk, please. Um, uh -huh. I would say in a couple of ways. My expectations from prayer started with the Chavara. What I expect to get out of prayer what I hope to get out of prayer and what I hope to put into prayer come from those experiences. Um, those were the most intensive prayer experiences of my life. Um, sometimes personally, but in terms of communally, I've never had any other experiences that come anywhere near those. Um, a lot of them had to be with being a kind of neophyte with regard to prayer. A lot of it had to do with the age of being in my, uh, uh, being in my early 20s. Uh, and a lot of it had to do with the group of people, with the newness of uh, a lot of the music, a lot of the songs, a lot of the nigunim that were there at the time, and um, mostly with the sense that um, this can be an uplifting experience in a way totally different from anything else I expected. And uh, it's informed my experiences. I have had a lot of experiences with different philot groups, you know, and they've always been disappointing. Um, I've never found another community that uh, davened like the Chavra davened. Um, I've had nice philot, you know, and sometimes intense philot, um, particularly, let's say, uh, uh, um, Eben Leader, you know, um, the leader minion. Um, is sometimes, and now it's kind of like straight, but so it used to be when, when Eben he was living in Jerusalem and when he would lead the davening and sometimes it was incredibly intense, certain moments of it. But the communal thing wasn't there. It was me connecting to what Eben is doing and other people connecting to that. And without Eben, it wasn't there in the same way. The Chavara davening experience was about the group. And there might be a very good Shalich Tzibur, it might have been Michael Strasfeld, it might have been Barry Holse, or it might have been somebody else, but it was ultimately the way the group came together around that person leading um, that made the experience you know, such a tremendous high. Why do you think that didn't work in other contexts as, as, as well? All the things I've said, partly age, mm. partly um, the newness of the experience, Partly the fact that, you know, I've been saying these tefillot for a long time, you know. 
And a lot of the songs I've been singing for a long time. And uh, like in many cases, the expectations that we have something, you know, that we can recreate or relive something that we had when we were young, just, it, it's very hard to do it. I mean, we have something else which enriches our, our, our lives. But um, those kinds of spiritual highs that I felt at those times, no. Do you think it had to do also with uh, sort of intentionality or the sort of covenant of the community All of that. as a community? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think also, uh, just to add one thing that isn't necessarily just about Chavara, but I think uh, when you're involved in a new project and you're a founder of it, you're in a, when you're in a founding group or the first couple of years of a founding group, there's an intensity, even in things that have nothing to do with spirituality and religion. Um, you know, I've been lucky to be involved in a few things like that in my life, in my more in my professional sphere and there's an intensity when you're in the founders group that is uh, it's fun it, it, it's it's very unique and then after that these projects often continue uh, but it's not the same as the beginning when you discover something it's 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 like when you're creating something new so yeah, I think, you know, yeah. putting it into a larger anthropological yeah. context, perhaps. Um, what about in other spheres than um, tefillah? For instance, you mentioned that uh, you've been involved in a number of pure chavruta situations. Yeah, I would say the desire to study, you know, came out of that. You know, the notion that you know, studying with another, with with another person or two or three other people. Um, could be a valuable experience as opposed to uh, having a teacher or sitting in a class or studying by myself, um, which are all good things, you know, but there was something about the business of uh, a bunch of friends getting together to sit around the around text and study a text. That certainly came from the Chavara. You know, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, it existed in the yeshiva world, yeah. the, the orthodox, but in the non-orthodox world, uh, and again, just as in the non-religious world, uh, something that is a remnant, I think, of the 60s and 70s, which were rebelling against hierarchy in a lot of fields, that we can do it ourselves. I mean, there you had teachers, but still the chavruta aspect uh, got much more, uh, I think it got a push by the rebellion against authority that was part of the 60s and 70s. It's part of the women's movement also. We yeah. can run our own groups. We don't need a group leader. We'll do it ourselves. And uh, In that spirit, I want to add a couple of things about the Jewish catalog. Yeah. Um, yeah. The it Jewish fits. catalog yeah. started um, through a conversation that Richie Siegel and I had. We, neither of us remembers it quite the same way, but it basically was this. We were building a sukkah uh, and we were using a method that Zalman had taught us, Zalman Schachter had taught us, which was using cinder blocks and two by fours. And it was pretty simple. You took a bunch of cinder blocks and you stuck a two by four in, you made four corners, and then you hung some blankets and stuff like that, and you made a sukkah. Very nice. And either I said to Richie, or Richie said to me, wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of vehicle by which we could share this with other people? And we both count that, I think, as the beginning of the Jewish catalog. And uh, what happened then was uh, that Richie and I wrote a master's thesis on this, and uh, we both started working on it together. I eventually dropped off because I was working on a doctoral program, uh, and then Michael Strasfeld and Sharon Strasfeld came in, and they created that thing. What, uh, as, as Bella just said to me, um, this was uh, very much the sense of do-it-yourself Judaism. You don't need a rabbi, you don't need a professional. Um, you can build a sukkah yourself. You can um, uh, learn how to use a lulav and esrog without having to go to Hebrew school. Okay, you can do all sorts of things, and um, the pleasure that you get from them, and the sense of involvement in Jewish life is so much greater than if you have somebody performing a particular thing for you. And that very much stood behind, you know, what the Jewish catalog was all about. And it certainly, was the central critique yeah, of the whole Jewish catalog. Exactly. And so uh, what Richie Siegel and Michael Strasfeld and Sharon Strasfeld developed through that, and they did it beautifully through all three volumes of the catalog, was something that could uh, take a lot of the ideas that we had in the Chavara and bring them out to a larger audience. In other words, it couldn't do that with regard to the intensity of prayer. 
And it couldn't do that with regard to the learning of specific Jewish texts, but with regard to all sorts of other values and all sorts of other behaviors, it could do that. And so the Jewish catalog then is definitely a direct outgrowth of the Chavurah Shalom and the Chavurah experience and the Chavurah idea, as you say, with regard to the counterculture. And, and not just to do it yourself, but that to do it yourself in a creative way. That too. You know, and, you and with humor. <laughs> well, if you look at the Jewish catalog, you just, they give you like models of, uh, you can do it in your own way. Uh, you know, it's something that speaks to some artistic thing in you or some humorous thing in you, know, that there's like a lot of ways to do things in life. Yeah. There's not one way. Important message, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, and the Jewish catalog uh, clearly was something touched touched a nerve. It was it was I think one of the the most the, one of the best sellers. I think it was J, JPS's best seller of all times. Yeah, it was a great resource. Yeah. It became a great resource and a great it inspired it inspired people. You know, here's some ways. It, and it was based on the whole Earth catalog which was a similar resource Access in a non-Jewish way. Was, yeah. That was very much a voice of the 60s, I think, mm -hmm. and the 70s. So I want to just go back for one minute. You just mentioned that you were in, uh, you and, and Richie Siegel were, uh, were in a, uh, a master's program. So I want to talk for a minute about uh, what you were doing at the time of, outside of the Havara, you were both pursuing uh, graduate degrees, Bella U in social work at Boston University and George uh, first in Jewish education through contemporary Jewish studies at Brandeis um, and later in a doctoral program right. in biblical studies right. in the Nedges department also at Brandeis. Um, would you say, either one of you, both of you, that your experiences in the Chavara in any way informed your career interests and the directions um, at the time and, and subsequently mm -hmm. as, as your, your life's work has evolved? Relative yeah, I'll, I'll answer that because I, I, I think it was precisely you know, the, way it, uh, the way they did uh, the Jewish catalogs that I think for me uh, it encouraged me to be an individual very much and to do things in my own way, also in my professional work. And what was your professional work? Um, I was a clinical social worker and uh, I didn't quite fit into any of the uh, existing uh, schools that I studied here. I studied a lot of different things, um, but I think that uh, what was most important to me was to do things in my own way. And uh, so at a certain point, two things that I did uh, like are stand out for me. One was together with a friend from that same Jewish women's group named Eva Fogelman. Uh, we were both uh, children of Holocaust survivors and we saw that nobody was dealing with the more normative issues of children of Holocaust survivors. It was only being dealt with on a, on a psychiatric uh, level. And uh, so we started running groups for children of Holocaust survivors to explore what are the issues and what are, what are people dealing with. And it, and it really, it was very powerful. And again, we didn't have anybody, well, we had some supervisors. I shouldn't say we had, again, Stephen Cohen and, and another uh, psychiatrist, you know, who sort of helped us on group process uh, things because we were very young. Um, but uh, in terms of exploring the whole, the whole project was just kind of the two of us figured it out together, and uh, and it was, it, I, I think it was it was a very powerful thing that helped a lot of people, and then a lot of other people uh, replicated the model in you know in their own way in different got into the Jewish Family and Children's Services and all sorts of therapists around the world. Just the concept of the, the concept. second generation. Exactly, and then yeah. lots and lots of groups and writing, and then Eva stayed in the field and you know expanded it in many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other thing was, um, you know, I worked in uh, regular clinics for years, and in I Israel, you're talking about now, in America you're... first in America and then in Israel. Uh, but my feminism, which started in that group, uh, was a very very strong thing in me and. Uh, at a certain point in Israel, I was fortunate enough to meet other 
women who were therapists and feminists. And it was just at a time in the history of feminist psychology when uh, feminist therapy was developing in America and England. And I started reading the literature and other people, and we got together and we created the Counseling Center for Women in Israel, which is a feminist therapy center that still uh, exists and thrives uh, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. What's the word um, of the feminist? Uh, it's bringing the feminist perspective, uh, both in terms of uh, the issues that we deal with, uh, with uh, our clients, uh, you know, like seeing uh, the places that the women's uh, needs uh, need to get more greater understanding or greater support within the therapy. And it's also about the therapy relationship, uh, trying to make it less hierarchical. I mean, there's a built-in hierarchy, always, but it's, it's an attempt to be more real and, uh, and, and, and more equal. Um, and then it's also specializing, you know, learning sp specialties in the l women's life cycle, you know, all the different aspects of the, the life cycle of a woman and, uh, you know, seeing a lot of people who have that particular who are at a particular stage and learning about that life cycle and then giving people a broader perspective on their own issues. But what I wanted to say was that we did it ourselves, that uh, you know, we, had, we certainly had teachers from the literature and te people who came and taught us over the years, but basically I, it was in the 80s, in the late 80s, and it, I think it was still the same people who had gone through the 60s and the 70s who had this sense that if something needs to get done in the world, just do it. Um, you know, don't wait for somebody to teach you how to do it, just do it. And, and for me, that's connected with the Chavara, the same mm. ethos of you just do it. And, you know, of course you find your teachers, but you aren't afraid to go and do your own thing and not to over-idealize your teachers. Right. Yeah. And now this, the feminist... Uh, What's it called? It's called Counseling Center for Women. It's almost 30 years old. Almost, I wanted to say that it's almost 30 years old. Yeah. Quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, remind me of the question. The yeah. impacts the impact. that I saw at the, that you can do it yourself. You can I would say uh, in two ways. First of all, Jewish education. Well, I, did a, I did a master's degree in Jewish education and uh, was thinking about that as a general uh, direction. But ultimately, uh, the pull towards studying texts was stronger for me, okay? And um, partly that came just from something inside me that loves studying old texts. And partly it came from, let's say, the model that I described before with regard to uh, study in the Chavura, with study with uh, Buzzy Fishbane uh, and other people. And uh, seeing those texts as really uh, deep expressions of uh, uh, spirituality and experience um, that I could somehow uh, perhaps try to, you know, to transmit to other people. So I would say um, living in Israel obviously has, you know, enabled me to bring those two things together. Um, and the different uh, uh, attractions that I have to ancient texts, to Hebrew language, um, and to teaching Jews um, about uh, you know what uh, you know what what we have in our uh, uh, grab bag of texts is uh, is really central. So it's not a direct line, you know. It's uh, but I think perhaps somewhat like what Bella says that um, certain things you know um, set me in a particular direction and move me in that direction, and I, I continue that way. So where do you teach now? I teach now primarily at uh, Machon Schechter, the Schechter Institute for Jewish Studies, and a little bit of Hebrew University. Um, and yeah, teaching biblical texts, that's, that, 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 that's what I do. Is there anything about your teaching style that sort of... I'm, I'm about? sure there is, but I couldn't specify what it is. Yeah. Um, that's to say, uh, um, I was taught by certain people who have passion, and I try to teach with passion myself. I was sought, taught by people who uh, care about the entire shape of a text and the message that it gives across, and I try to get that across as well. But beyond that, I, I wouldn't it's know. It's not how to dry, it. yeah. it's juicy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've lived most of your, much of your adult lives in Israel at this point. Um, and Bella, one of your primary critiques of uh, the Chavara was that it wasn't Zionistic and that it was 
not involved in Israel or in the larger Jewish world. Does that still feel like a valid critique to you now? Do you see any impact of the Hover movement on Jewish religious life outside of America? I do. I, I, I think it has a much, uh, but it could be just because it was ours and some people who were, not, uh, who were not involved in it would disagree. But I think it had a big impact on the huge proliferation in both uh, United States and other places, Europe, Israel, on do-it-yourself minyanim, uh, that uh, you know people got empowered uh, by that model and making, trying to make it with intensity and with community. And I think that it, it had a, it, you know, it's again, it's not a direct impact, but I think in an indirect way, a lot of those people had impact on people who had impact on things that also happened in Israel, on rabbinical students everywhere in the non-Orthodox world. Um, yeah, I think it's it. I'm less sanguine. I'm less, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I would agree with you. I think you're right with regard to Europe and the United States, with regards to a sense of pluralistic Jewish expression that's become uh, almost standard uh, in, in much of the Jewish community, and to some extent in certain Orthodox Jewish communities as well, but primarily in the non-Orthodox Jewish community. And the, you know, uh, but I, I don't see that necessarily in Israel. That's to say, um, there certainly is a growing sense of pluralism, but I don't see that as something that has necessarily come out of the counterculture or the Chavara movement. I, I wasn't talking about pluralism. No. I was talking about the, uh, that you can create your own minion in your own way that you can just do it, that a, a group of people can get together and, and, and create their community. Yeah, again, I don't see that as something that came mm. out of the cover. I mean, that's always been the case in Orthodox Judaism. I mean, the shul that I don't go to is I go to this other shul across mm. the street because I reject them. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it seems to me that the great majority of non-Orthodox synagogues and minyanim are run by professionals. That's to say they tend to have rabbis or they tend to have leaders. I think there are a couple of exceptions. Yes, that's my sense of it. Certainly that's true in the reform movement and that's true to a great extent in the conservative movement as well. There are exceptions, but they are exceptions. And um, whereas in the Orthodox movement, I think it's been following the same path that Orthodoxy, you know, the Jew, that Jewish uh, no. minion even been following. No, for, but for not the ones that have incorporated a lot more feminist aspects. There's some, there, there are definitely in Jerusalem several that have incorporated feminist aspects uh, that didn't come from the Orthodox world. And I don't know, maybe it didn't come from the liberal, from mm -hmm. the Chavara movement, but uh, I, agree with I, you I think it probably did. I'm talking about the feminist yeah. things. I'm talking yeah. about like the Shira Hadasha, the, I don't know, the... Different. Uh, yeah. Again, I, I don't agree with you. I, I think the I think Orthodox <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Orthodox feminism has has developed on its own track. Okay, maybe um, you're right. And, this, and movements like Kolech uh, and uh, Jofa. the Jofa um, have not developed the way they have developed because of the Chavura. I think feminism has had a tremendous effect there, and that's very uh, uh, you know, and that's very important. But I don't think it's necessarily. A byproduct of the Chavara movement in the same way. Do you think way, the Chavara had any impact on on the on the development of, of Jewish feminist consciousness yes. and feminism? It's a question for, actually for both of you. Yes, I would agree I with do. that. I would agree with what Bella said. I that. do, and but, I even think the Orthodox yeah. were. I, I don't agree with him because I think yeah. the Orthodox were so far behind and uh, disempowered that I think that at least in an indirect way. They saw all these women rabbis all of a sudden. I, I think it did have an impact. I think, uh, I, don't, I don't even know if they would, I don't know, I don't know if they, they certainly wouldn't agree with me and they wouldn't admit it, but I do think that all these women in, in the non-Orthodox world uh, being in, in leadership positions influenced, I, I don't know, it's just my own impression. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. based on research. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, is there anything else you'd like to add about the overall, uh, what you see as the impact of the Chavara movement on American Jewish life in particular, or uh, Jewish life in general? 
I can't speak to American Jewish life since we don't live here. Right. You know, and my experience is we come to visit, we go to a minyan here, we go there, we see what's going on. That's very nice. Um, so I don't really know. Chabra movement. The question was about yeah. the movement. Yeah. Well, Chabra not just during this early yeah. period, but it's collect. You know, I it's think impact collectively. Yeah, no, I think it did have. I think it. Uh, I. St I mean, we're not going to agree on this, but I think it influenced the way the uh, non-Orthodox uh, rabbinical schools are oh, much more enlivened. Uh, and I mean, we just went to uh, the, like the big renewal synagogue in uh, New York. Uh, and I was very touched by how lively it was. Um, and I, I don't know the, the two women who were leading it, but I have a feeling that they were influenced by the Chavra movement. I don't know, one was from the Reform, and one was from the Re Reconstructionist, and it was really wonderful. Um, a far cry, you're saying, from the yeah. critiques yeah. of American Judaism and Jewish synagogue yeah. life as sterile, yeah. not That's right, etc. right, B'nai Jeshurun. Yeah. You know, it was wonderful. I mean, uh, and, there were, and it, there were a lot of people there who otherwise, I think, would be alienated. Um, so I think the Jewish renewal was one way that it went, and you know, and, and different synagogues where they have, you know, rab rabbis. I think it's through the rabbis probably that it got also through that it entered. It influenced the rabbinical schools. Well, there, there I would say, yeah. Here, the debt to first Zalman and Karlbach, and then to art, and to Karlbach and Shlomo Karlbach. Well, Karlbach is different. He was a minstrel. He was a very talented minstrel, but he was a minstrel. No, he, he was wasn't a founder. A teacher. He That's wasn't a founder true. of institutions. What Zalman did and what Art has done had been to found institutions. And in terms of change and effect on the American Jewish community, it's institutions that matter. So, in which institutions are you talking about? So, Zalman, with, it's with regard to Jewish renewal, and he's really the father of Jewish renewal in America, and um, perhaps in the world. And with Art, with regard first to his connection with the Reconstructionist movement and his many ways reshaping the Reconstructionist movement in the 10 years or whatever that he was yeah. at, perhaps less. Yeah. Um, he really did reshape the Reconstructionist movement and move them away from Mordechai Kaplan towards a neo-Hasidic vision, which is much more the way the Reconstructionist movement is now. And obviously... And the, the Hebrew College. The tremendous success of Hebrew College, you rabbinical know, school. the rabbinical school, uh, is, uh, you know, I think further indication of his tremendous talents, and the talents are not just in teaching texts and not just inspiring individuals, but in working with institutions. And so Art, the uh, person who is anti-institutional in his nature, by his nature, has done something wonderful for the institutions of American Judaism. And in that sense, I would say yes, the Chavara has, you know, from what I know of the American Jewish community, that is interest. You know, Halavai, you know, I wish that that would influence uh, Judaism in Israel in the same way. Wait and see. They're trying. <laughs> and even the reform, I think, might have been... I don't know that much, but I think even the reform uh, rabbinical students were influenced also to a livelier mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank I you. want to thank you so much, both of you, for okay. participating in this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for guiding us in this. Thank uh, you very much.